lawfully cherished by Li Wen Wai Ho. Chapter 1. Natasha. Natasha Livingston wished the letter she'd found on her doorstep that morning was a love letter. It was a simple wish for a single female on her 25th birthday who had no romantic prospects on her horizon. Like zero, nada, zilch. She hadn't had a date in over a year, and the majority of the males in her life as a piano teacher were under five feet tall. So it was no surprise that she'd been the recipient of a prank. A prank in the form of a note with four simple words pieced together from magazine cutouts. I am watching you. A shiver ran down Natasha's back as she felt the folded piece of paper in her pocket. She'd been getting chills all day, despite the warmer-than-usual temperatures on this early April morning. For a San Francisco native, she was sure acting like a tourist today, bundled up in a winter coat, thick scarf, and boots. It didn't matter that she'd been indoors for the last hour. The extra layers formed a shield around her body, keeping her safe and secure from everything that might threaten her, the fog, the wind, and, of course, the boogeyman. Her pent-up nerves made her fidgety, and she found herself crossing and uncrossing her stockinged legs over and over again. With clammy hands, she smoothed down her dusty rose vintage skirt. She planted her feet on the ground and focused on the slow and steady notes coming from the old upright piano beside her. Tucking a strand of her long dark hair behind one ear, she nodded in approval. Her students at Hearts and Hands, an after-school program for disadvantaged families, had made great progress this past year. She was beyond thankful to be a part of these kids' lives and couldn't think of a better way to spend her birthday than with her students. Miss Natasha, what do you think? A young boy with scruffy blonde hair falling into his blue eyes peered up at her from the worn piano bench where he sat. His right hand played the notes of a major scale, holding down the yellowed keys with his small fingers. Did I get it right this time? Yes, that's perfect, Timmy. All your practicing is paying off. Natasha flashed the boy a smile and gave his hair a gentle tousle. Wait until your mom hears you play next week at our recital. You're going to knock her socks off. Timmy frowned, his shoulders slouching. But she's only got two pairs of good socks, and she needs them both for work. Oh, sweetie, it's just a saying, she reassured him. It means she's going to be so impressed by how well you play. No one will be losing any real socks. Okay. He nodded with an expression too serious for a six-year-old. With a quick jump, he hopped off the bench and landed on his worn sneakers. Can I go now? It's snack time. Yes, of course. I'll see you next time. She stood and returned the young boy's hug, her heart sinking at how thin his frame was. She made a mental note to bring in more granola bars the next time she came to teach. And a pair of socks for Timmy's mom. Her heart went out to the young woman who worked two jobs just to make ends meet. An older, gray-haired woman wearing a bright yellow sweater approached Natasha. She had the appearance of a jolly grandmother and treated all the children running about the room like they were her own, despite their cultural differences. When she reached Natasha in the corner of the room, she scooped her up in a great big hug. Happy birthday, love. Not so loud, please. Natasha breathed in the woman's sweet scent of lavender and honey, pausing an extra beat before she pulled away. Mrs. Douglas, or Mrs. D, as she preferred to be called, was the closest thing to a mother in her life. Having lost her own parents when she was five, Natasha treasured the care and affection Mrs. D showered on her, even when it bordered on embarrassing. 
I don't want the kids to know, so please don't make it a big deal. Mrs. D waved her hand in the air. I already told them. You don't think they'd let their favorite teacher run off without a proper celebration, do you? This was all their idea. Their idea. Natasha spun around as the pitter-patter of two dozen little feet pounded across the linoleum floor. A sea of smiling faces led by none other than Timmy came running up to her. Each of the children held a colorful drawing, most of them of a stick figure with music notes drawn next to it. They lined up and presented their gifts to her until she had a whole stack of papers in her hands. Her eyes filled with tears as she hugged them one by one. This is wonderful. Thank you so much, boys and girls. This is my best birthday ever. The children ran off with beaming faces to finish their snacks of goldfish crackers and watered. Now aren't you glad you let them bless you, dear? Mrs. D. cooed, her cheeks a rosy red. You are so generous with your time and heart, it's the least we can do to show our appreciation. Now if only we could afford to pay you, no, Mrs. D., Natasha cut in quickly. The smiles on the children's faces are enough. I don't need anything more. Besides peace of mind, the statement was true. God had provided more than enough for her over the years with the inheritance her parents had left her. She had been able to afford a nice little condo on the outskirts of the city. Whatever other expenses she had, she was able to cover with her income as a piano teacher at a local community college. I'm just thankful I get to make a small difference in these kids' lives. They're so bright and talented. I can't wait for them to show off what they've learned at the recital. I've been thinking, I can come in every day this week to help them practice. Mrs. D frowned at the mention of the word recital. She wrung her hands together and lowered her voice. Dear, there's something you should know. How do I say this? What is it? It's very unlikely there will be a recital or, she sighed, an after-school program at all next week. What do you mean? Natasha shook her head, not knowing if she had heard Mrs. D correctly. She studied her expression with narrowed eyes. This had to be a joke. A thought popped into her mind. The letter she found that morning, this news about the program, she suddenly remembered what day it was. Oh my goodness, I can't believe I totally forgot today's April Fool's Day. You're pulling my leg, right? It all makes sense now, she added with a relieved sigh. Any reservations she'd had about the letter disappeared. Unfortunately, this is the truth, Natasha. I'm afraid the center is being forced to shut its doors. We just don't have the funding to continue. We're running on fumes as it is. Some of the staff and I pitched in to keep the lights on this week, but come Friday, the landlord's going to expect a rent check. Natasha's stomach twisted in a dozen knots. This couldn't be happening. All these students would be turned away, left at home as latchkey kids, with no tutoring services, no arts and crafts classes, and no music lessons for who knew how many hours while their parents were away at work. Some of the children were only in kindergarten. She couldn't let this happen. Even as she prayed for an answer, she set her shoulders back and raised her chin. So we have four days to come up with the money. We'll get the community involved and bring in enough cash to cover the next month's rent at least. I'll go to businesses and ask them to sponsor us. We can do this. Mrs. D gave her a half-hearted pat on the arm. I appreciate your enthusiasm, dear, but it's not that simple. We also found out the building is in really bad shape, 
it's not earthquake safe. And it so happens there's a loophole in the lease that says we're responsible for structural repairs. Even if we could cover the rent, we would never be able to come up with the million dollars we'd need to retrofit the place. I'm as torn up about this as you are. But we need to face facts. This place has done its job of caring for children for over 20 years. I'm afraid this may be God's way of closing one door to open another. But what about the kids? What about the staff? Where are you all going to go? This can't be the end. Natasha balked. She didn't want to admit it, but there was a part of her that wondered what would become of herself without the kids. This center with its peeling paint and musty smell was her one bright spot in the week. Seeing the kids, especially Timmy, gave her a taste of the love she had longed for in her childhood, even more so now. I won't let this place close. Oh, dear, unless there's a way for you to come up with a million dollars, I'm afraid there's no other choice. Mrs. D released a heavy breath and squeezed out a smile. We'll be having a farewell party on Friday at 3. I hope you can stop by and see the kids one last time. She gave Natasha another hug. Sorry to burden you with bad news on your birthday. Don't be sorry. I'm glad you told me. This place is like my second home. Of course, I'd want to know what's going on here. I knew you would. I do hope you still get some celebrating in today. Maybe go on a date with a nice boy, she added in a hopeful tone. I'm sure there are many who would love to take you out. You're smart, kind, and beautiful. Natasha scoffed. If that was true, why had the only man she ever loved walked away? She shook her head. The only boys in my life are here. I plan on getting takeout and watching a chick flick. That's the only way I'm sure to get my happy ending. Mrs. D patted her cheek. You'll get yours someday. I have faith. She called out over her shoulder as she walked away. Natasha grabbed her purse and book bag hanging off the back of her wooden chair, then took a long look around the room. On second thought, she might end up having a date tonight after all, but not a romantic one. She had a plan to save the rec center, and a visit to see her rich uncle was at the heart of it. It was time to claim the generous trust fund he'd set up for her even if it meant adhering to the ridiculous clause he'd attached to it. The least of her problems was finding a boyfriend. What she needed now was a husband. Chapter 2 Victor Victor Price could think of a dozen other things he'd like to be doing today, instead of staking out a luxury hotel in downtown San Francisco. Several options crossed his mind, lying on the beach somewhere with a good drink in hand, sitting in a concert hall listening to the melodic swells of Mozart, or playing a round of pool with his old colleagues from the precinct. Even desk duty sounded better than his current mission of spying on the comings and goings of a scorned woman's wayward husband. His gaze flicked to his surroundings, taking in the view. The hotel was a large, impressive white building with tall columns that reached the fourth floor. Some of the people walking by wore suits, while others dressed more casually in jeans and jackets. He observed their behavior, the makes and models of the vehicles parked along the street, even the number of times a trolley passed by. He made mental notes of all these details, storing them away in his mind. One never knew when a piece of information would be important to a case. He rubbed his hand across his scruffy jawline, then took another swig of coffee from the paper cup sitting on the center console of his sedan. Like his car, he was dressed in all black, from his sweater and jeans to a pair of waterproof ankle boots. In his line of work, he had perfected the art of blending in. Fortunately, 
his clients hadn't. He cocked his head to get a clearer view of the person coming out the revolving door. Victor pulled up some pictures his client had sent him on his phone and compared them to the man passing by his car. Balding. Mid-fifties. Check. A limp in his right leg. Check. Everything matched up. But where was the woman his wife suspected he was cheating on her with? Ten seconds later, Victor got his answer. A leggy redhead in a tight miniskirt emerged from the hotel, her eyes darting up and down the sidewalk. Victor held up his phone and caught her on camera just before she turned, heading in the opposite direction of where the man had gone. With another sigh, he quickly typed up an email, attached the photo he'd taken, and sent off the evidence to his client. A few minutes later, a message popped up on his screen confirming a new transfer into his banking account. He tossed his phone to the side and leaned back against his seat. Considering the fact that it was April Fool's Day, he might have laughed at where his career choices had taken him. But this was no joke. Victor Price, former decorated police officer, was now relegated to the dirty work of a P.I. This was not how he imagined his life turning out. You made your choice, Price, he murmured under his breath. This is what you get for not following protocol. You botched a case. You let the perp get away. And you, his voice trailed off as he finished the sentence in his head. You got your partner killed. Victor fisted his hands and swallowed the lump in his throat. It had been five years since Nicholas Livingston took a bullet that was meant for him. Five years since he'd lost his best friend and given up the job he loved. And five long years of guilt and shame. He wondered sometimes how he was still alive. In all honesty, the only thing that kept him going was the thought that Nick couldn't have died in vain. He also had to keep the promise he'd made to him, to keep an eye on his baby sister. Those two things, plus his faith, motivated him to wake up each day and to keep one foot moving in front of the other. There had to be a reason God had spared his life. From his sweater, he pulled out his last gift from Nick, a silver cross he wore around his neck. Clutching it in his hand, he said a quick prayer. It was the same prayer he said every day, first for protection over Nick's sister, then for strength for himself. He didn't have much faith, but he supposed whatever he had was enough. Natasha was safe and he. Well, he was still alive. That's all he could ask for. The ringing of his phone jerked him out of his thoughts. He groaned to see an unlisted number flash across the screen. Probably a new client with another cheating spouse for him to follow. He answered with a gruff, hello. Victor, a low, commanding voice greeted him. This is Silas Livingston. Victor shot up in his seat. Nick's uncle. The tech billionaire contacted him from time to time whenever he needed Victor to dig into the background of one of his employees. He hadn't heard from him in months though. Mr. Livingston, hello. How are you? There's an urgent matter I need you to attend to. Of course, sir. Victor's mind raced as he considered why Silas might be calling him today. There was an unfamiliar edge to the older man's voice. It's regarding Natasha. Victor's heart began pounding at the mention of Nick's younger sister. Did something happen to her? Is she okay? She's fine. For now, at least. For now. The hair on Victor's arms stood up, a telltale sign from his cop days that something wasn't right. What do you mean, sir? Is she in some kind of trouble? I suspect she is, or will be. I just received a threatening letter in the mail.
It came in an unmarked envelope with a sentence cut out from a magazine. I know where she lives. I have a feeling she refers to Natasha. I have no other living relatives to speak of and certainly no one of significance in my life. I've been trying to reach her for the past hour, but she turns her phone off when she's teaching. I need you to pick her up from the rec center and bring her to my home. Of course, sir. Heart racing, Victor checked his watch. 4.30 on a Monday afternoon. Traffic in the city was always bad, but now that rush hour had started, it'd take him some time to make it across the city. It was a good thing he was more than familiar with these streets. I'm on my way now. Thank you, Victor. His voice faltered as he continued. Please keep her safe. You have my word. Victor started his car and pulled onto the street already packed with commuters rushing to get home. Squinting against the late afternoon sunshine, he weaved in and out of traffic, relying on the fast reflexes he'd gained from his years of chasing down criminals. A long-forgotten thrill of adrenaline rushed through his veins. He sped toward the Sunset District, eager to reach Natasha before she left the community center. He was especially wary of the fact that she didn't own a car, instead relying on public transportation to get around the Bay Area. Who knew whose ride-sharing vehicle she'd get in today? It could very well belong to the person who had sent the threatening note to Silas. Victor had to stop her before she walked straight into a dangerous situation. He slowed the car as he neared Lawton Street, scanning the sidewalk for signs of a petite brunette. Where is she? he asked out loud. She couldn't have gotten very far. Silence answered him. Victor smirked, partly in amusement, partly from self-pity. In the years since he'd started working solo, he'd gotten into the habit of talking to himself. That's what a guy did when he no longer had anyone to confide in. It was times like this that he missed having a partner or even a friend. He supposed God could hear him still, and for that, he was grateful. He was going to need the Lord's help more than ever right now to locate Natasha. Suddenly, he spotted a head of nearly black hair. The hair reminded him so much of Nick's, except that it was thicker and hung halfway down the woman's back. It was Natasha, he was sure of it. He drove forward until he could see her profile. With the curb full of parked cars, he had no choice but to stop in the middle of the street. He rolled down the passenger side window, ready to call out to her, when she paused and spun around. Her eyes immediately landed on Victor's car, narrowing in suspicion. She cocked her head as she studied him for a good three seconds. Worry flickered across her face, along with confusion, as she made her way to his car. With a cautious tone, she asked, Victor. What are you doing here? Victor's mouth grew dry, the bitter taste of coffee coating his tongue. The young woman standing before him bore a striking resemblance to his old partner. The siblings shared the same fair complexion and defined features, but Natasha was also distinctly different with her long dark lashes and full pink lips. She wore minimal makeup, but the small amount served to highlight her natural beauty. He blinked twice, completely mesmerized by her light green eyes. It had been years since he'd seen Natasha face to face. A little over six years since they'd dated behind Nick's back. Victor hadn't liked keeping secrets from his best friend, but Natasha had insisted life would be easier without her overprotective brother looking over their shoulders. Victor had agreed, knowing his and Natasha's ten-year age difference wouldn't have sat well with Nick. Honestly, to any outsider, he and Natasha didn't make sense. She was innocent and refined, he'd been rough around the edges, a reformed rule-breaker. 
but they shared a love of music, and they got each other. All was going well until the fateful day when everything changed. After Nick's death, he'd broken things off and never contacted her again. In keeping his promise to Nick, however, he made it a point to check in on Natasha from time to time. But he always did so from a distance. Having only seen her from his car parked across the street, he hadn't realized she had grown even more gorgeous since the last time he saw her. Your uncle, he managed to utter two words before he lost his train of thought. The car behind him honked, pulling him out of his stupor. Focus, he reprimanded himself. Natasha Livingston was an assignment, nothing more. Swallowing hard, he tried again. Your uncle asked me to pick you up. Get in, please. I'll take you to his place now. She took a step toward the car, then stopped. Indignation colored her cheeks. Is this some kind of April Fool's joke? I haven't seen you since the memorial service, and suddenly you show up out of the blue. Why didn't Uncle Silas call me himself? He did. He's been trying to reach you for the past hour. Will you please get in the car? He has reason to believe you're in danger. Natasha scoffed. She crossed her arms over her coat. Danger? What kind of danger? I'll explain, he insisted loudly amidst more honking as cars sped around him, as soon as you get in. Tasha, please. With one hand on the handle, she flashed him a skeptical look before opening the door. She quickly climbed into his car, tucked her legs to one side, and shut the door. Victor released a heavy sigh as he stepped on the gas. Frustration replaced all the pleasant emotions he'd had a moment ago. He and Natasha had a lot of water under the bridge to deal with. He set his mind on this fact and not on his overwhelming urge to breathe in the sweet floral scent of her perfume. This was business, strictly business, Victor reminded himself. He was most definitely not looking to rekindle a relationship with his ex-girlfriend. Chapter 3 Natasha This was the strangest birthday surprise Natasha had ever received. Never in her life did she imagine her old boyfriend pulling up in front of the rec center to pick her up. The last time she'd seen Victor, he'd been a shell of a man. Neither she nor her uncle had blamed him for her brother's death, but he had walked like a man guilty of murder, bent over with guilt and grief. She'd thought about him often in the years that had passed, wondering if he had moved on with his life. From her initial impressions today, it was fair to say he hadn't. Sitting in his beat-up sedan as they drove south along I-280, she snuck a look at Victor from the corner of her eye. He was leaner now, the angles of his jawline more defined. The dark circles under his eyes spoke of sleepless nights, something she herself was all too familiar with. His dark hair was shorter than she remembered with a touch of gray at the temples. Victor was only thirty-five, yet he appeared much more weary than a man his age. Victor had been a wild card when he and Nicky met at the police academy. Confident and brash, he'd almost gotten kicked out for partying too hard and skipping classes. Nicky had been the one to get him on the straight and narrow, sharing the gospel with him, not so much with words, but through his patience and acceptance. Natasha had witnessed Victor's heart change over time and found her own heart softening toward him. Yes, she'd fallen for his bad boy image but she had really fallen in love with him after he became a Christian. Victor had been her first love and only love. Until the horrible day that changed all of their lives, Natasha had so many questions to ask him, she didn't know where to start. Questions about her brother's last words and whether he had suffered or not. 
The police reports told her one thing, but she had always wanted to hear it from Victor himself. He was the last person to see Nikki alive. But this was a topic best saved for another time. There were more pressing matters at hand. She twisted in her seat to face him. So, why am I in danger? You said you'd tell me everything once I got in the car, but you haven't said a word for the last fifteen minutes. Victor shot her a side glance, then returned his eyes to the bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic up ahead. He tapped the fingers of his right hand on the steering wheel before replying. Your uncle received a letter about you. At least he suspects it's about you. It said, I know where she lives. That's all he told me so far. The hair on the back of her neck stood on end. A shiver traveled down her back, causing her to shake. What was it with letters today? As much as she wanted to believe this was another April Fool's joke, the coincidence was too great. She pulled out the piece of paper from her pocket and unfolded it. I got a letter this morning, too. Why didn't you say something? Victor gestured impatiently for her to hand over the paper. He glanced at it and shot her a stern look. You knew you were in danger, yet you still went to the rec center today. You should have gone to your uncle's or to the police, anything else, but carry on as if nothing had happened. Natasha's brows shot up to see Victor's face flush red. She didn't appreciate the accusation in his tone. He was treating her like a child who didn't know right from wrong. Squaring her shoulders, she retorted, You're making it sound like I knowingly put myself in danger. I did no such thing. I was fine all day. I'm still fine. Victims always think they're fine, until they're not. It's the illusion of safety that puts you in danger. You've got to stay alert. Never let your guard down. She eyed him with concern. He wasn't kidding. The way his gaze flitted about the car, from the rearview mirror to his side mirror and back again, showed he practiced what he preached. Natasha wondered, however, if it was also a sign of paranoia. Perhaps witnessing Nikki's death had messed with his mind. She chose her next words carefully, thinking it best to lighten the mood. You do realize what day today is, don't you? It's Monday. The first day of April. He paused. Happy birthday, by the way. Thanks. Natasha was touched, he remembered. She tried not to dwell on it though, it wasn't a hard date to remember. It's April Fool's Day. When I found the letter on my doorstep, I thought it was someone playing a joke on me. I would have called the police if I'd known it was a real threat. A joke? Victor scoffed. A joke is adding food coloring to a carton of milk or squirting water from one of those plastic flowers in someone's face. A joke is leaving a whoopee cushion on somebody's chair. Does this, he waved the letter in front of her face, look like a whoopee cushion to you? Natasha gawked at Victor for a few seconds, the corners of her mouth twitching. She could tell by his firm tone that he meant every word he said, but the situation was too absurd for her to keep a straight face. A giggle escaped her lips before she could stop it. She clamped one hand over her mouth, but not before she snorted. Victor flashed her an incredulous look. This is not a laughing matter. She nodded, schooling her features. I know. I didn't mean to laugh. It's just that I never ever in my life thought I'd hear you say the words whoopee cushion. And you just said them twice. A mental image of a red rubbery balloon popped into her head, causing her to giggle again. She turned toward her passenger side window to try to compose herself. 
maybe she was the one losing her mind. She hadn't found anything so funny in a long, long time. And now that she'd started laughing, she couldn't stop. She repeated the mantra, it's not that funny, it's not that funny, until she finally caught her breath. When she turned to face Victor again, she steeled herself for a look of disapproval. Surprisingly enough, a smirk played on his lips. He worked his jaw to suppress it, but the appearance of a dimple in his right cheek proved his efforts unsuccessful. He stole a quick glance at Natasha, giving her the smallest hint of a smile when their eyes met. She gasped dramatically. I thought you'd lost it. A crease between his brows appeared, but his tone stayed light. Lost what? The ability to smile, she teased. I thought maybe your facial muscles only worked in one direction now. Victor flashed her an unimpressed look. I'm a man of many surprises, he answered drolly, not missing a beat. His dimple peeked out again as he smirked. Natasha couldn't help but grin. There was the Victor she remembered, the confident and quick-thinking man she'd fallen for. Now that he wasn't frowning, there was a softness to his features. His whole countenance was brighter. His shoulders dropped as his chest rose and fell with slow, even breaths. Her eyes traveled across his broad shoulders, noticing how good his sweater looked on him. Or how good he made the sweater look. She swallowed hard. She couldn't deny how much she was still attracted to Victor, despite the fact that tall, dark, and brooding was so not her type anymore. Who was she kidding? He was definitely her type. Natasha shook her head free of the notion, then shoved it to the corner of her mind where she hoped it would disappear. She wasn't looking to get hurt again. Not by any man, especially not by Victor. The cars in front of them began moving, urging them to follow. Victor stepped on the gas, his posture stiffening as he concentrated on the road. He became all business again, his brows furrowed and jaw set. His hands gripped the steering wheel until his knuckles turned white. Without warning, he jerked the car to the right, squeezing them into a small opening behind a truck. Hold on, he barked to Natasha as he drove them across several lanes at once to reach the turnoff. Holding onto the door handle, Natasha braced herself as her body swung from side to side. Colors blurred before her eyes as they passed multiple cars, the freeway sign, and a row of small trees planted along the freeway. Her heart rate picked up speed, reminding her of the frantic pace of the flight of the bumblebee. That piece always gave her an adrenaline rush when she played it, but it was nothing compared to the fear running through her veins now. She squeezed her eyes shut and prayed the world would stop spinning when she opened them. After a few minutes, the car slowed down, and Victor let out a loud sigh. Are you okay? Natasha opened her eyes and looked around. They were on a local street now, driving up the familiar hilly road leading up to her uncle's mansion in Hillsborough. Shadows fell over them as they drove past the tall trees lining both sides of the road. She glanced in her side mirror, relaxing when she saw there was no one behind them. Still trying to process everything that had happened, she jumped in her seat and Victor called out to her again. I asked if you're okay. I'm fine. She brought a hand to her chest where her heart was still pounding just a little freaked out. What happened? Someone had been tailing us since we got on the freeway. An older black Cadillac, no plates. The driver wore dark shades. She glared at him. Are you serious? But why? Who? My money's on whoever it was that sent you and your uncle those letters. 
A wave of cold fear washed over Natasha as the reality of the situation sank in. This was definitely not an April Fool's Day prank. Someone was after her, and she had no idea why. Chapter 4 Victor Victor's jaw dropped in awe as he drove up the road leading to Silas Livingston's mansion. The two-story home, with its white columns and large floor-to-ceiling windows, sat at the top of a hill overlooking the bay. With tall trees surrounding it on all sides and the closest neighbor half a mile away, the home was quiet and secluded. Still, he did a visual sweep of the area, relaxing a little at the sight of half a dozen men in dark suits and shades standing along the property line. No doubt a tech genius billionaire would be well protected with his own entourage of bodyguards. He also spotted several security cameras perched atop the roof, turning in their direction as they neared the wrought iron main gate. Soon after, the gate opened, allowing them to enter. Victor drove up the expansive driveway and parked at a curb beside a row of statues that looked like they belonged in a European museum. A uniformed man with salt and pepper hair walked up as he and Natasha exited the car. Natasha's face lit up with a friendly smile. Alfred, how are you? I'm well, dear. Alfred gave her a kind smile, then looked over at Victor. Who is this you've brought along today? I don't recall you ever bringing a boy to meet your uncle. She flashed Victor a dubious look. He's a family friend, Alfred. Victor nodded in agreement, although he definitely used the word friend loosely. While he and Natasha had been more than friendly once, he wasn't sure what they were now. The name's Victor Price. Silas asked me to bring Natasha here. Is he home? Mr. Livingston is in the study. Please follow me. Alfred led them past a large fountain and through the glass-paned front doors. Once inside the brightly lit mansion, they walked along the marble floor until they reached a rectangular room with two wall-to-wall -wall bookshelves. Gold-colored curtains at the end of the room framed a sliding door leading to the terrace. Alfred gestured for them to enter then left them with a curt nod of the head. A tall man with dark blonde hair stood outside in the sunlight, his back facing them. At the sound of their footsteps, he turned around. He wore a casual pair of jeans, a blue vest, and a collared shirt that made him look more like a middle-aged engineer than a man who had made Forbes Three Comma Club last year. His green eyes, a similar shade to Natasha's, lit up behind his black-rimmed glasses. Natasha, thank God Victor found you. Are you all right? Natasha ran up to her uncle and greeted him with a kiss on the cheek. I'm fine, Uncle Silas. But what's going on? Victor said there was someone following us on the way here. I don't understand why anyone would be after me. I'm just a piano teacher. I don't own anything of value. A pained look crossed Silas's face. I'm afraid this individual is using you to get to me. He's a former employee after my money. I can't say much more as I don't want to put you further at risk. I've already notified the authorities, and they've assured me they will take care of everything. It's only a matter of time now before they have enough evidence to make an arrest. That sounds serious. Natasha hesitated, her brows furrowed. I'm glad the police have a lead, but what are we supposed to do in the meantime? I've ramped up my security detail at the mansion. The police have also agreed to send a patrol car around to check up on me every few hours. I will be safe here, as will you, he remarked to Natasha. It would be in your best interest to stay sequestered here with me until this blows over. Sequestered. 
but I need to be at the rec center every day this week to help the kids. We have a recital coming up. Silas frowned. Natasha, you yourself said someone was following you earlier. It's not wise for you to be out and about. I wouldn't be walking the streets, just going to and from my place to the rec center. Victor had been observing their exchange, but he couldn't stay silent anymore. Didn't Natasha realize the danger she was in? Silas, you should know that Natasha received a letter this morning, too. This stalker knows where she lives. It's not safe for her to stay there. Natasha flashed Victor a look of disdain. Her green eyes narrowed as they accused him of sabotaging her plans. Crossing his arms against his chest, Victor held her gaze, his own unapologetic. He wasn't about to let her become a moving target. Why didn't you tell me about the letter? Silas asked. Do you have it with you? We'll need to hand it over to the police. I didn't want to worry you more, Natasha piped up in her own defense. She took the letter from her coat pocket and handed it to her uncle. It's a little late for that. Silas sighed as he read the note. Natasha, this is all the more reason why you need to stay here. These people are not playing around. They have the resources to do some real harm. But the kids need me. Their lives are already so unstable. I need to be there for them. Which is why you need to stay safe, Silas reiterated. You'd do them little good if you got hurt, or worse. Uncle Silas, nothing's going to happen. Doubt clouded Silas's eyes as he looked from Natasha to Victor and back again. After a moment, he addressed Victor. I need to ask a favor of you, Victor. Victor immediately crossed the room to Silas's side. He hadn't expected to be pulled into the conversation, but he was ready to assist. Perhaps Silas needed an extra pair of eyes manning the security cameras. His police background came in handy at times like these. Yes, sir. Whatever you need, I'm here to help. With one hand on Victor's shoulder, Silas gave him a grateful smile. I appreciate it. Nick always spoke highly of you and treated you like family. I know you're someone I can fully trust. Victor opened his mouth to protest, but Silas held one hand up to silence him. Everything in him, however, wanted to scream that Nick had been wrong. If he was trustworthy, Nick wouldn't be dead. He shook his head but couldn't get a word out before Silas continued speaking. Since Natasha insists on continuing her daily activities, despite the danger it poses for her, he added wryly, I am hiring you to look after her. What? Both Victor and Natasha exclaimed at once. Uncle Silas, I don't need a babysitter, she insisted. I can take care of myself. The uneasiness in her tone matched the tightness in Victor's chest. What do you mean by look after, sir? Are you asking me to drive Natasha around and make sure she gets to her destination safely? That I can do. Yes, and more. I need you to be by her side 24-7. Ensure she is safe at all times. I need you to act as her bodyguard. Bodyguard? Natasha's cheeks reddened. Isn't that a bit much? I wouldn't want to inconvenience Victor like that. I'm sure he has plenty of other things he needs to do instead of play bodyguard. It took a second for Victor to comprehend Silas's request. A job as Natasha's bodyguard. He supposed it made sense, considering the situation. But that would mean being around her all the time. That couldn't possibly be a good idea. 
He would however be keeping his promise to Nick by keeping his sister safe. He cleared his throat and tried to sound nonchalant. It wouldn't be an inconvenience. I can do it. Relief softened Silas's features. Thank you, Victor. That takes a great load off my mind. Now we just need to get the two of you to a secure location. Natasha cocked her head to one side. Wait, I can't go home. The two of you will stay at my condo in the city, Uncle Silas declared firmly. It's equipped with all the latest security measures. The place is fully furnished. If there's anything else you need, I will arrange to have it delivered to you. Natasha nodded thoughtfully, seeming to have accepted her fate. I'll need to arrange for time off from work. But at least I'll be close to the rec center. I can still go and see the kids. Silas gave her a pointed look. Only if Victor deems it safe for you to go. But, Natasha, promise me you'll follow his instructions. I already lost your brother, God help me if I lose you, too. His words had a sobering effect on Natasha, who immediately clamped her mouth shut. All right. I promise. Uncle Silas nodded. Thank you. She released a heavy breath before asking, Can I talk to you alone for a minute, Uncle Silas? Victor took his cue to leave, stepping out into the hallway until he found himself in front of a room with a white marble pool table. He stepped inside, drawn to the exquisite decor, from the huge chandelier hanging overhead to a five-foot-tall speaker system in the shape of an hourglass. Glancing around, he marveled at the opulence of a house he'd never be able to afford. Secretly, he considered this bodyguard gig a blessing in disguise. His finances had been tight lately since his income wasn't consistent. He didn't know how much Silas was planning to pay him, but perhaps he'd earn enough to give him a temporary cushion. It would be nice to not have to rely on cheating spouses to pay the bills. It cheapened his work to spy on people. He missed his days on the force when he actually made a difference in protecting and serving the community. Being a bodyguard wouldn't be so bad. He'd actually feel like he was doing something worthwhile, even enjoyable. An image of Natasha's green eyes came to mind, making his pulse race. He braced himself against the pool table and quickly pushed the image aside. He had to remain objective. He couldn't let himself love her again. He exhaled deeply, vowing to keep his head on straight. He could do it, he reasoned to himself. Natasha was a client, just like any other female he'd done business with. As if on cue, she walked into the room. His head jerked up at the sound of her light footsteps approaching. He was surprised to see the determined look on her face when she reached his side. Everything good? Yeah, uh, everything's fine. She paused, chewing her lower lip. It's just that I'm hoping you could do me a big favor. Of course. I'm already going to keep an eye on you day and night. I doubt there's much more you could ask of me, he added with a smirk. Oh, you'd be surprised. She nodded toward two chairs at the other end of the room. I think you'll want to sit down for this. Victor eyed her curiously. Why did he have a feeling she was going to ask him to sign his life away? Chapter 5 Natasha Natasha fiddled with the hem of her coat as she considered how to present her idea to Victor. She wondered if this was how men felt when they were about to propose marriage to a woman. Having Victor's dark brown eyes focused on her didn't help ease her nerves. In fact, his intense gaze made her all the more aware of her heart pounding in her chest. She could do this, she had to do this for the sake of the kids. 
The rec center had to remain open, and she was their last hope. What is it? Victor asked, his voice coated with concern. What do you need from me? I, she paused, knowing her next words were going to sound crazy. The whole idea was absurd, yet it was the only one that made sense at the moment. Taking a deep breath, she blurted out, I need you to marry me. Victor's face blanched. He blinked quickly, staring at her as if she'd grown another head. After a moment, however, his shoulders shook as he began chuckling. You got me, Tasha, you got me good. This is some kind of April Fool's joke, isn't it? You know, I never gave this day much thought before, but I can see why some people find it amusing. Natasha sat motionless, surprised to hear Victor laughing again. The sound was deep and full, rising from his belly and filling the air like the ringing of a low-pitched handbell. She sighed. He wouldn't be laughing though when he realized this wasn't a prank. I'm not joking, Victor. I really need you to marry me. He sobered immediately rubbing his hand down his face and literally wiping his smile away. What are you talking about? Silas asked me to keep an eye on you, not marry you. Please hear me out. This wouldn't be a real marriage. It would be on paper only. I need a husband so I can access more money from my trust fund from Uncle Silas. He has a clause that requires me to be married if I want to access more than a million dollars at a time. I need the money for the rec center, Victor. They'll be forced to close if they don't have the funds they need to retrofit the building and to pay for their rent and the staff's salaries. Natasha's eyes welled up at the thought. As crazy as this plan is, I need to go through with it for the kids. Will you help me? Victor shook his head in disbelief. I still don't understand. What's the point in having such a clause? Natasha sighed. She had never understood her uncle's reasoning behind it either. Even earlier when she'd asked him about it, she still hadn't bought his words. I don't want you to end up rich and lonely like me, he'd stated. Having money may make things easier, but it doesn't take the place of love. I want you to have someone to share your life and money with. But, Uncle Silas, she'd said, I need the money now. Please, can you make an exception, just this time? There's no one I want to marry. Then you haven't considered all your options, he had answered. Her pleas had landed on deaf ears which was why she was now forced to go with Plan B. She was pretty sure B stood for beg because that's what she felt like she was doing. If Nikki were still alive, she was sure he'd be laughing in her face right now to see her level of desperation. Or maybe he would be giving her a stern lecture for considering Victor as husband material. Definitely, the latter. Do you want the short or long answer? she asked wincing at the horror on Victor's face. She was trying not to take his reaction personally, but it seemed like he was equating marrying her to getting his teeth pulled without anesthesia, whichever one makes any logical sense at all. Well, Uncle Silas wants to see me settle down. She paused, trying to come up with the best explanation she could think of. I believe he's worried that if I have so much money before I'm married, there will be guys who'll want to get close to me for all the wrong reasons, namely my bank account. He wants to prevent that from happening, which I guess makes sense. While it made sense on the outside, marrying her old boyfriend was about the most illogical decision she'd ever made. Sure, Victor was her dream man, handsome, stable, and trustworthy but he was practically a stranger now. She had no idea what his life was like these days. What if he was dating someone? The thought made her stomach turn. He seemed to read her mind with his next remark. 
marriage, or relationships for that matter, haven't been on my radar. I don't know that I'm the best candidate for this, he hesitated, this job. There must be someone else you can ask to do this. I'm afraid there isn't anyone else. I've lost touch with my guy friends from college. I wouldn't be able to find anyone on such short notice, at least not someone I trust. Have you tried online dating recently? She quirked a brow. Let me tell you, there are plenty of fish in the sea, but the majority of them are stinky and slimy. You're the best option I have. You mean the only option? Victor sighed. He rose from his seat and began pacing the room from one side to the other. It kind of works out since you'll be stuck babysitting me for the unforeseeable future. And it's not forever. I get a payout every month I'm married. We can get an annulment after a month, maybe two. Still silent, Victor raked his hands through his hair. He raised his eyes to the ceiling as if in prayer. Natasha sensed his hesitation like it was a thick, black cloud of smoke sucking up all the air in the room. She quickly spoke up, throwing out some more motivation his way. I'll pay you for the trouble. He halted in his steps, spinning around to face her. With his hands on his hips, he regarded her with a frown. I don't want your money. I already owe you a debt I can never repay. What are you talking about? What debt? Your brother gave his life for me. I owe Nick everything, which means I owe you everything. Understanding set in, shaking Natasha to the core. He still carried around so much guilt. Victor, Nicky did what he did because he wanted to. You don't owe me anything. Which is why I insist on paying you, if you agree to this plan. I'll give you a million dollars. What do you say? His mouth immediately fell open. A full ten seconds passed before he overcame his shock. He finally picked up his jaw and replied, I'll do it. I'll marry you. Natasha released the breath she'd been holding. This was a lot easier than she'd anticipated. And a lot more intimidating. Had she thought through this more before she opened her mouth, she might have changed her mind. But it was too late. She was getting married. To her first love. Surely, Nikki was looking down from heaven right now, shaking his head at her. It's only on paper, she reminded herself, it's only on paper. That thought gave her some comfort, but her real consolation was the fact that she'd be saving the rec center from closing. Timmy, and all the other boys and girls, would still have a place to go after school. And they could still have the recital as planned. Great, she exclaimed with more enthusiasm than she felt. I really appreciate you doing this. I know the folks at the rec center do, too. The kids there are amazing, they deserve so much more than what they have. This is going to help so many people. She sprang to her feet, ready to get her plans rolling before she lost her nerve. So, uh, would you be okay getting married today? Victor's eyes grew wide. Today, he coughed out. She nodded. I need to get the money transferred as soon as possible. The bank's closed by now, so it won't happen until tomorrow, but I'd like to do it first thing in the morning. Which means I need to get married today. How? Where? I assume we'll be going to the courthouse, but it's closed as well. You forget I'm a billionaire with connections, a low voice boomed from the doorway. Natasha and Victor turned around to find Silas walking in, a bright smile on his face. He approached them and placed one hand on each of their shoulders. 
I see you two have come to an agreement. We have. Victor has been gracious enough to help me out. I'm happy you went with my suggestion, Natasha. I have faith this will work out. Her uncle gave her shoulder a gentle squeeze before turning to Victor. Welcome to the family, Victor. I know Nick would have approved of this match. Victor's complexion paled as he squeezed out a smile. I, uh, thank you, sir. That's Uncle Silas to you now. Right, Uncle Silas, Victor stammered. It's going to take me a while to get used to saying that. Now, regarding the logistics, Silas continued, I'll contact the person who notarizes my contracts and get her here. She'll be able to issue your marriage license and also perform the ceremony. Natasha nodded, pasting on a smile. It was with this smile that she began her contractual marriage. Within the hour, she and Victor had signed the forms needed to cement their commitment to each other. Uncle Silas had even arranged for a pair of wedding bands to be delivered to the mansion. When the officiant, a young woman dressed in a power suit, arrived, she directed them to face each other. They exchanged rings, along with some simple vows. Natasha Joy Livingston, do you take this man to be your lawfully wedded husband? Natasha lifted her eyes to meet Victor's as they stood in front of the marble fireplace. Her heart pounding, she answered, I do. Victor Studley Price, do you take this woman to be your lawfully wedded wife? Natasha's brows shot up. Studley. In the year they'd been together, he had never mentioned his middle name to her. Despite the seriousness of the situation, she had the sudden urge to laugh. Victor must have noticed her shoulders shaking because he flashed her a stern look. She mouthed a quick, sorry, then pressed her lips together. Soon enough though, she saw the corner of his mouth twitch and his dimple peek out. Victor was having as hard of a time keeping a straight face as she was. He finally let loose a soft chuckle. My parents were trying to be different, he explained. I told you I was full of surprises. You weren't kidding. Natasha dabbed at the corner of her eyes as she gave in to her laughter. The officiant and Uncle Silas joined in, too, breaking the tension in the room. When the playful moment had passed, the officiant repeated her question to Victor. Do you take this woman to be your lawfully wedded wife? Victor's gaze landed on Natasha, his expression serious again. With a firm nod, he replied, I do. By the power vested in me by the state of California and in the presence of God and this witness, I now pronounce you husband and wife. She turned to Victor with a smile. You may kiss the bride. Natasha's nerves immediately returned. She stole a glance at Victor, noting the uneasiness flickering across his face. That won't be necessary, Natasha insisted, yet her eyes couldn't help but be drawn to Victor's mouth. She licked her lips and found herself wondering what it would feel like to kiss him again. Her face heated at the thought. There was no way she could go there. This was a contract, nothing more. As if to affirm this thought, Victor offered her his hand. The action almost made her laugh. Who shook hands at their wedding? Strangers, she supposed, which they were again. Scoffing softly, she reached out and took his hand. As soon as they touched, tingles spread through her fingers all the way up her arm. Natasha gasped, immediately breaking off their contact. She dropped her gaze, avoiding Victor's eyes. The last thing she needed was to have feelings for the man she just married, especially when he didn't feel the same for her anymore. Chapter 6 Victor 
Victor turned the polished brass handle to the front door of Uncle Silas's condo and stepped aside to allow Natasha to enter first. For a second, the thought of carrying her over the threshold crossed his mind, but he quickly shoved it aside. He and Natasha might be legally married, but they were nowhere close to being husband and wife. He'd given up on that dream long ago. He didn't deserve her love. He didn't deserve much of anything anymore. Instead, he'd learned to rely on himself, especially after leaving the force. Nowadays, he worked alone, ate alone, and lived alone. But that was in the past. Starting today, he had to think and act like a bodyguard. Someone who kept a level head and did everything possible to protect his client. A man who didn't let emotions sway him. As long as he remained objective about Natasha, he'd have no problems doing his job. He followed her into the condo, taking a visual sweep up and down the brightly lit hall before closing the door. Their drive back to the city had been without incident, but he knew better than to let his guard down. Even though this building had its own security measures, he still felt safer checking things out himself. This skyscraper, however, was unlike any place he'd ever staked out or stepped foot in. While the lower half of the tower housed office spaces, the upper half was reserved for luxury residences. Everything about the huge open floor plan screamed money. The furniture and decor were made from only the best quality materials, including marble, gold, and silk. From his vantage point, he spotted several plush, semicircular sofas, a coffee table in the shape of a teardrop, and the largest flat screen TV he'd ever seen. This is crazy, he murmured under his breath as he took in his surroundings. This sole unit on the 60th floor, with floor to ceiling walls of glass, boasted an impressive view of the bay. The setting sun appeared as a strip of orange and red sandwiched between the vivid blues of the sky above and the sparkling waters below. Walking over to one of the windows, Victor whistled as he marveled at the beautiful scene. Take a look at that view. It's amazing, Natasha called from where she stood near the sofas. Especially from this side of the room. Victor quirked a brow. She was usually bubbly and positive, so her lack of enthusiasm confused him. He wondered if she was having second thoughts about their marriage agreement, he certainly wouldn't blame her if she did. A big part of himself still couldn't swallow the fact that he had married his old girlfriend. Coupled with that was the realization that he was on his way to becoming a millionaire. It was all a bit much to wrap his mind around. He turned around to find Natasha with her arms crossed and face pale. His chest tightened with worry as he crossed the room to her side. Are you all right? Totally fine, she squeaked out. Except for the fact that I'm deathly afraid of heights, remember? Victor winced. How could he have forgotten? That's right. You almost passed out when we got stuck on the Ferris wheel. He stopped himself short, immediately regretting bringing up the past. She nodded in chagrin. On our first date. Yeah, that was bad. She held on to the armrest of the sofa as she sank onto its plush seat. With a quick motion, she grabbed the bright red throw pillow next to her and hugged it to her chest. I'm just going to stick to this side of the room and remind myself to take slow, deep breaths. Victor watched her, unsure of how to help. When she'd started to panic during the carnival ride, he'd held her in his arms and prayed over her. As much as he wanted to do the same now, he couldn't. Not even as beads of sweat dotted her forehead and upper lip and her body trembled in fear. So much for being Natasha's protector. There was nothing he could do in this situation to make her feel safe 500 feet off the ground. 
is there anything I can get for you? She leaned back in her seat with her eyes closed. Some cold water. Of course. He made his way to the adjacent room. The kitchen appeared less extravagant with its plain cream-colored cabinets, but only until he opened the large stainless steel refrigerator. The shelves were stocked with every type of drink imaginable, from organic smoothies in every color of the rainbow to probiotic cold brew coffee. There were also several frosted bottles, decorated with small crystals, that bore the label, Filico Jewelry Water. He grabbed one and brought it back to Natasha. Here you go. She opened her eyes and took the bottle from him. Thanks. I'll get a grip on myself soon. I just need time to get used to the view. He took a seat beside her, stretching his long legs out in front of him. It's fine. We all have things we're not comfortable with. Sure, but I should have gotten over this years ago. It's embarrassing. He scoffed. You're talking to a guy with the middle name Studley. If anyone has a reason to be embarrassed, it's me. She almost spit out her mouthful of water. Okay, you've got a point there. I can't believe you never told me. Victor smiled to see some color returning to her cheeks. Perhaps the best way to help was by distracting her. He continued talking, spouting off the first thing that came to mind. And risk having you laugh at me the way you are right now. No, thanks. Your brother already gave me a hard time when he found out. You wouldn't believe how many nicknames he came up with. Studman. Studmaster. There were a couple more I can't recall right now. Stud Muffin, she added with a snort. I'm sure Nicky would have used that one. He always made fun of me when I called my favorite actors that. I might have repressed that one in particular. Victor gazed off into the distance as old memories came rushing back. He'd been a troublemaker back at the academy, but Nick had taken him under his wing. He learned so much from him on how to be a respectable man and a good cop. Nick had been the male role model Victor had always wanted. If only he were still alive. There was so much Victor still wanted to learn from him. What's on your mind? He realized Natasha was staring at him with concern. Nothing much. Just thinking about old times. I miss him, Natasha remarked wistfully, stating the exact words on his mind. She reached out and placed her hand on his arm. It's nice to be able to talk about Nicky with someone who knew him well. Victor stared down at the sleeve of his jacket where her hand still lay. Her long, tapered fingers, as delicate and graceful as they looked, gave him a tremendous amount of comfort. He inhaled sharply, overwhelmed by a surge of emotions he usually kept bottled up. He looked away for fear that Natasha would notice the tears in his eyes. Releasing a shaky breath, he tried to maintain his composure. Yeah, it is nice. She gave his arm a gentle squeeze before pulling her hand back. Thanks for sitting with me. I'm feeling better now. That's good to hear, he managed to utter despite the lump in his throat. It's been a strange day, hasn't it? she remarked. I feel like I aged ten years today, not just one. It's not exactly how I imagined this day turning out either when I woke up this morning. I suppose God had different plans for me. For us. I hope he has different plans for the rec center, too. A wistful smile curved her lips. Thank you again for doing this, Victor. It feels good to reconnect, despite the strange circumstances. He nodded. Of course. 
she regarded him quietly for a moment. So, ah, uh, how have you been? Their gazes locked, and the kindness he saw in her green eyes made his body warm. Natasha had always had a knack for making him feel comfortable. There was something so sweet and innocent about her that made him want to let his guard down. He couldn't though, so he kept his answer curt. Fine. Busy. P.I. work takes up a lot of my time. I see. She hesitated, her expression thoughtful. Is that why you never returned any of my calls? Victor cringed. Did they have to do this now? From the determined look on her face, he knew he wasn't getting out of answering this question. Taking a deep breath, he mentally prepared himself. It was going to be a long night. Chapter 7 Natasha Natasha knew she'd caught Victor off guard when she decided to bring up the past. Well, it was more her heart doing the talking than her head. She'd long decided not to dwell on the could-have-beens, but her mouth had asked the question before her brain could filter it out. She needed to know why Victor had ended their relationship. Especially at a time and she needed him the most. I, he faltered, unable to meet her eyes. I was going through a lot of stuff. It was better that you didn't have to deal with them, with me. Her heart ached at his admission. Victor had always tried to appear as a tough guy on the outside, so for him to say even this much meant a lot to her. You didn't give me a chance to decide if I wanted to or not. In case you couldn't tell, I wanted to be there for you. That's why I called and texted you every day for a month after the funeral. She blinked back tears as she recalled that dark time. I was going through a lot of stuff, too. I thought we were going to help each other through it. But you shut me out. That really hurt, he finally lifted his gaze. I'm sorry, Tasha. I never meant to hurt you. The sorrow in his face was evident. She nodded, knowing he spoke the truth. She had always thought their relationship could have worked out had the circumstances been different. Victor wouldn't have broken up with her if Nikki were still alive. I know. I know you were hurting, too. You still are. He scoffed, as if she'd implied something ridiculous. What? I'm fine. Fine, my foot. You are not fine. You've lost so much weight your clothes don't fit you right, and you hardly smile anymore. At her last comment, he smirked. I've smiled quite a lot in the last few hours. You saw it yourself. A lot is stretching it, she touted, unconvinced. It's like you have a cloud constantly hanging over your head. You're like Eeyore, but grumpier. What happened to the victor the first used to know? He was fun and carefree and loud. I miss that guy. Surprise flickered across Victor's face, disappearing as quickly as it appeared. Where did he go? He realized life wasn't all fun and games. That foolish decisions can lead to irreversible consequences. The pain in his voice broke her heart. But it also gave her the courage to speak the truth. What about redemption? Some things may not be reversible, but they can be redeemed. Nicky's in heaven. He's been reunited with our parents, and he's with God. There's nothing better than that. He lifted his head, his eyes vacant of hope. While all that is true, it doesn't erase the fact that Nick's death left you alone. You've got no other immediate family left. It's just you against the world. His words made her pause. She'd be lying if she didn't say she got lonely sometimes. 
Her uncle had been there for her and her brother after their parents died, but he'd always put his work first. Nick had tried his best to make holidays and birthdays special. Now that he was gone, she spent most of her time working. Second to the Lord, music was her savior. Playing and teaching piano gave her joy and purpose. She filled her mornings teaching young adults at a local community college, but her time at the rec center in the afternoons fulfilled her the most. The kids and staff there had become her family. Without them, she wouldn't know what to do with the love in her heart. Saving the center was as much for her as it was for the kids. I'm not alone, she declared firmly. God's with me, and he knows what I need. But you, she gave him a pointed look, you need to stop beating yourself up. Nikki didn't give up his life for you so you could live the rest of yours feeling sorry for yourself. Sorry. I don't feel sorry for myself. His face flushed as his voice took on an edge. I don't know what you're talking about. Yes, you do. You wish you were the one who got shot that day. So you're living your life as if you did, all wounded and sad. But Nicky wouldn't have wanted that. He'd want you to be happy. Victor slumped in his seat and shrugged. Happiness is overrated. Well, it's a lot better than sadness and regret and whatever else has had you trapped for the past five years. Her tone was harsher than she planned, but she was too worked up to back down. She couldn't believe how much Victor had missed out on because he thought he needed to punish himself. You could still be working on the force and doing what you love. You'd still have friends to hang out with. I know you haven't kept in touch with anyone at the precinct. I talked to Sergeant O'Brien recently. He told me you stopped playing pool with them years ago. He pulled at a stray thread hanging from his jacket hem. It's not fun when I win all the time. She rolled her eyes. That's a lame excuse, and you know it. You're not that good at pool. Chuckling softly, his dark eyes lit up as he looked over at her. You haven't changed at all, Tasha. Still as headstrong as ever and not afraid to call me out. It feels good to be talking to you again. A lump formed in her throat to see crinkles appear around his eyes. He used to smile like this at her all the time, especially when Nikki wasn't looking. It was his secret smile reserved just for her. She swallowed hard as a truth hit her in that moment, making her heart hurt again. She had also missed out on what could have been five great years with Victor. Who knows where life would have taken them had they stayed together. Maybe they would have gotten married, for real, for love. Maybe she wouldn't feel so alone. It was selfish of her to think this way, but she couldn't help the way she felt. But no use dwelling on things she couldn't change. She needed to focus on the positives instead. How God had given her a chance to reconnect with Victor and to see him smile. It was more than she'd hoped for. But she knew better than to hope for more. She rose from the sofa and gathered up her purse and coat. I think I'm going to turn in. I'm pretty beat. His brows rose in surprise. Oh, yeah, of course. We can talk more tomorrow. He stood up as well to bid her good night. She headed toward the hallway, pausing to ask, Do you think it's safe to go to the rec center tomorrow? I want to talk to them about my donation and also help the kids prepare for their recital. I think it's safer if we stay out of sight for the rest of the week and the weekend. We can stop by for a short visit come Monday. Her face fell in disappointment. Okay, sure. Good night.
She released a heavy sigh as she walked away, wondering how she was going to survive being cooped up in the condo with Victor. The only remedy she could think of was to treat him as a friend. A platonic, no history between them, kind of friend. This way, she wouldn't miss him when their relationship ended again one day, as it inevitably would. Chapter 8 Victor Shortly after midnight, Victor rubbed his tired eyes as he stared at the screen of the 17-inch laptop he'd found on the coffee table. It was one of several laptops and tablets Silas had stocked for them along with several video game consoles. This condo certainly qualified as a bachelor pad, albeit a fancier version of his own. He scrolled through the website he had found with details about the skyscraper they were staying in. The building was even more extravagant than he'd realized with its own conservatory, a fitness center, a library, and a lounge with a baby grand piano. The seventh floor led to a five-acre transit center and a rooftop park with its own gardens, two-story restaurant, and a playground. The luxury condo even offered anticipatory service, the definition of which he found online, a proactive approach to customer service. He wondered if this meant the concierge and staff could read the residents' minds. That superpower could surely come in handy, especially when it came to understanding his ex-girlfriend. He leaned back against the plush sofa, hands laced behind his head. He wasn't sure why Natasha had clammed up earlier. She had gone from being vocal, then light-hearted, to reserved. Just as he was starting to feel comfortable with her, she had decided to call it a night. Was it something he'd said, or hadn't said? He wished he understood what was on her mind. Even still, talking to Natasha had comforted him. He appreciated how she'd listened without judgment and even extended grace to him. Hearing from her own lips that Nick would have wanted him to live a full life gave him a taste of the peace he'd been looking for the past five years. Now if he could only do the same for Natasha. His cell phone buzzed in his front pocket, signaling an incoming phone call. He took it out and swiped it open to silence the ringing. Even though Natasha was sleeping at the other end of the large condo, he didn't want to risk waking her up. Hello? Price, my man, it's Sam. A low gravelly voice came over the line. It's been so long since I heard from you, I thought the voicemail you left me was a prank call. Victor scoffed. Sam O'Brien, the officer who had trained him years ago as a rookie, loved to joke around. He was also good for a favor whenever Victor needed a license plate number checked for his PI work. He hadn't called Sam in over a year, but Victor figured he was the best person to ask for help. Not quite. April Fool's Day was yesterday. Sam chuckled. It sure was. Speaking of which, we miss your face around here. You're a fool to not come back to the squad, Price. Leave it to you to compliment and insult me in the same breath. He smiled drolly, knowing Sam was speaking the truth in love. I'm not ready yet, but I might consider it. I'm actually on an assignment right now, an important job I need to see through. Rescuing another damsel in distress from a loveless marriage. Victor could picture Sam rolling his blue-gray eyes to the ceiling of the precinct during his late-night shift. The older man didn't think much of his P.I. work, only because he thought Victor belonged on the force. Sort of. Except that this damsel is a tough cookie, and the marriage she's in, let's just say it's complicated. He rolled his own eyes as he considered his and Natasha's current situation. Complicated was only touching the surface. Sounds intriguing. So what do you need from me? Want me to run some plates? Not at the moment. 
but I do need to know everything on file about the Silas Livingston case, any leads you have, and the profile of the perp. Silas Livingston. Wait a minute, he paused, isn't that Nick's uncle? I knew that name sounded familiar. That's the one. Silas hired me to look after his niece. There's a guy threatening both of them. A former employee of his. What can you tell me about him? There was a rustling of papers before Sam answered. We think it's Milton Hayes. Age 48. Married, no kids. Former software engineer at Livingston Enterprises. Employment terminated as of the new year. Do you have a picture you could send me? Sure. I'll forward it to you now. Victor's phone dinged as a new message came in. He took a moment to open the message and glance at the color image. A slightly balding man with dark, beady eyes and a dimpled chin stared back at him. With a button-down polo and a pair of thick glasses on, he appeared like a typical employee working in Silicon Valley. Any criminal history that you know of? Just a handful of speeding tickets, nothing else. His record's pretty clean. He doesn't seem like the stalker type either according to everyone who knows him. The only thing we have to go on is a verbal threat he made against Mr. Livingston in a voicemail last month. He stated and quote, my wife's threatening to leave me because I lost my job. You're the reason my marriage is ending. You're going to pay for this. Victor rubbed his chin, feeling the stubble growing in there. Seems like an open and shut case. Why haven't you guys brought him in for questioning? Sam sighed. We would if we could find the guy. He's gone missing in action. Booked a one-way plane ticket to Florida over the weekend. His wife says he emptied their bank accounts and packed up his clothes. What about his credit cards? Have you traced them? Yep. No activity since he bought his ticket. Airport surveillance shows him landing in Tampa and leaving the airport in a taxi. That's the last we've seen of him. This doesn't sound like the guy. Something in Victor's gut told him so. The real perp is still out there, I'm sure of it. You're probably right. You always had a good sense of these things. That's why we need you back on the force, Price. It's where you belong. It's where Nick would have wanted you to be. Victor took a deep breath. I need to finish this assignment first. I made a promise to Nick that I have to keep. But I'll be in touch. Thanks for the info, Sam. Anytime. If I find out anything more, I'll let you know. With a final word of thanks, Victor ended the call. His stomach filled with dread as he considered the information Sam had given him. Without a suspect on the radar, he might as well be dodging a ghost. He spent the next few minutes in prayer, asking for a breakthrough in the case. If he was going to protect Natasha, he needed the Lord's intervention. Once he opened his eyes, his gaze landed on the floor-to-ceiling windows directly opposite of him. The moon shone bright, casting a pale glow on the city skyline and the dark waters of the ocean below. The sight was beautiful to behold, until he remembered how frightened Natasha had been. He decided to remedy the situation as best as he could. He hoped the gesture would at least make their next few days in the condo bearable. It was going to be a challenging time for them to be stuck in isolation with nothing else but each other. Chapter 9 Natasha Natasha padded along the heated tile floors of the condo in her bare feet as she headed for the kitchen. She'd gone to bed without eating dinner last night, 
a decision she regretted as soon as she woke up. Yesterday had been such a crazy day, she just didn't have an appetite. She'd make up for it now though. As she neared the end of the hall, her chest constricted as her acrophobia returned. Saying a prayer for courage, she entered the living room, hoping to pass through as quickly as possible. She paused in her steps, however, when she spotted two cream-colored bedsheets taped over the windows. Only the top third of the glass was left uncovered to reveal the morning sky. A rush of relief and gratitude washed over Natasha. Victor had done this for her. The act took her completely by surprise. It touched her to know he still cared for her, even if just as a friend. She entered the kitchen, eager to thank him. She spotted him at the stove with his back to her. His large frame blocked the frying pan from view, but she guessed from the greasy aroma in the air that he was cooking bacon. He had changed out of his outfit from the day before to a navy polo and a new pair of jeans, a very tight pair that seemed molded to his hips and legs. Her cheeks heated as she found her eyes lingering, and she immediately raised her gaze. She scolded herself, feeling embarrassed that she'd even look at Victor that way. It didn't matter that they were technically married. He was an old friend doing her a favor. Albeit a very attractive old friend she happened to have loved before. Her stomach chose that moment to grumble loudly, causing Victor to turn around. He greeted her with a relaxed smile that lit up his dark brown eyes. His handsome face made her insides melt and her cheeks even hotter. Burning with embarrassment, she cleared her throat and uttered a quick, good morning. He waved the metal spatula in his hand in greeting. Morning. Are you feeling okay? You look flushed. I am fine. It's just these floors, she rushed on to say. They really warm you up. They're something, aren't they? Victor agreed. This whole condo is full of surprises. It took me a few tries to figure out all the buttons on the remote for the toilet. Oh, the bidet. You've never used one before. The only remote I have experience with is for the TV. He smirked before turning his attention back to the frying pan. Speaking of which, it'd be nice to catch a game on the one in the living room. That's one perk I could get used to. Natasha quickly averted her eyes and opened the fridge for a beverage. This platonic relationship might be harder to play out than she anticipated. She grabbed a bottle of green juice and took a long sip of it to cool herself. Oh, thank you so much for covering up the windows in the living room. That was really sweet of you. He glanced her way and nodded. No problem. It was an easy fix. Breakfast is ready if you want to grab a seat. Her eyes went wide when she saw the food sizzling in the pan. That looks so good. I'm starving, as you heard. I did. He chuckled. I would be, too, except that I already had some toast. Some kind of organic, sprouted bread. I can't believe you ate that. You hate food that tastes healthy. I was desperate. It actually wasn't too bad. Better than eating cardboard. Well, any bread that costs over $50 a loaf should taste better than cardboard. $50. Yup. Uncle Silas has particular taste. She took a seat at the small round table on the other side of the kitchen counter. I think it comes with being a billionaire. Victor placed two plates of food on the table before easing himself slowly into the chair across from hers. With a grimace, he asked, does that include particular taste in clothing 
too? These jeans he had stocked for me aren't as comfortable as what I normally wear. I was wondering about that. I've never seen you in pants so tight before. She did her best to hold back her laughter, but a giggle escaped her lips. He flashed her a wary look. It feels like I'm wearing a straitjacket for my legs. I bet he asked his stylist to choose our outfits. He has one that he works with for his press conferences when he tries to look less geeky. I'm not too crazy about my outfit either, but at least I can move freely in it. He gave her an appreciative glance, taking in her long-sleeved orange and black tiger print jumpsuit. I think you look great. You're breathtaking, no matter what you wear. Thanks, Natasha murmured as she awkwardly pushed a lock of her long dark hair behind one ear. You're breathtaking. Victor had never said those words to her before. She tried not to make a big deal out of his comment, but she couldn't help the fluttering in her stomach. He cleared his throat, seeming to realize he'd said too much. Why don't I say grace so we can eat? She nodded and closed her eyes, both thankful and disappointed they weren't holding hands like they used to when they prayed. Lord, we thank you for another day you have granted us. We ask for your protection upon Natasha and her uncle, too. May this meal nourish us for the tasks ahead. In Jesus' name, Amen. Natasha chimed in with her own Amen and opened her eyes. A thought niggled in the corner of her mind as she picked up her fork. Why didn't you pray for yourself? Hmm. He swallowed his bite of food before replying. I did. I thanked God for giving me another day. I mean, for your protection. You only prayed for me and Uncle Silas. You forgot yourself. His brows furrowed, causing lines to crease his forehead. He looked more like the victor from yesterday, pensive and broody. I'm a bodyguard, Tasha. I don't need protection. I'm the one doing the protecting, with God's help, of course. But you should still pray for yourself. How are you supposed to protect me if you're not safe? Victor wiped his mouth with a napkin then crumpled it in his fist. He spoke firmly, that's the only way. I'm ready to take a bullet for you. If I need to risk my safety for yours, so be it. That's what I trained for as a cop. She stopped eating, her appetite all but gone. She almost regretted bringing up this topic of conversation. Victor's intense gaze made her heart clench. He was so willing to put his well-being on the line, it seemed almost as if he didn't value his own life anymore. His negativity bothered her to no end, but knowing the way Victor thought gave her a new sense of purpose. Setting her fork down, she made up her mind to help her old friend. Victor might be her bodyguard, but she would be his lifeguard. Someone to help breathe life back into his apathetic heart. As soon as we can go out, I'm taking you to do some retail therapy. Dumbfounded, his mouth fell open. Why? Because those skinny jeans are squeezing out all the joy in your heart, she exclaimed. Her brows shot up in exasperation. Do you hear yourself? You're all gloom and doom. It's depressing. I'm being realistic. Realistic, my foot. You should be less concerned about protecting me from bullets and more concerned with how your pessimistic attitude is slowly killing me on the inside. She crossed her eyes and stuck her tongue out the side of her mouth. He smirked. Very funny. Is that a smile I see? She teased. The corners of his mouth twitched. Maybe. My middle name's not joy for nothing. 
with me around in some baggier pants, you'll be feeling better in no time. He scoffed, chuckling softly under his breath. She beamed, proud to be having a positive effect on Victor already. But I'm serious about going shopping. I want to pick up some things for myself, too. Every one of my outfits in the closet is either spotted or striped. I'd rather not go to the rec center dressed like an animal. None of the kids will take me seriously if I show up looking like Tony the Tiger. Victor cocked his head to one side, his expression contemplative. Why not? Stripes are gur rate. He stuck one index finger up and punched his arm into the air. Her mouth fell open. The sight of his goofy smile took her breath away. There was the guy she remembered. I guess he needed a reminder to come out again. He winked. But don't get too used to it. Natasha's body warmed under his gaze. Would it be possible to heed his warning? Being around Victor and seeing his old self made her own heart feel alive. More alive and less lonely than she'd felt in a long, long time. But it was as Victor said, this was a temporary assignment. She couldn't let herself get attached, no matter how much she wanted to. Chapter 10 Victor Victor shrugged into the navy sports jacket Natasha had picked out for him and turned to see his reflection in the dressing room mirror. Although the jacket fit him well, it was more fashionable than his usual style. He glanced at the price tag and almost swallowed his tongue. This one piece of clothing cost more than anything he'd ever bought, besides his car. He carefully took it off and decided to stick to purchasing the non-skinny jeans he now wore. Becoming a millionaire didn't mean he'd have to live like one. He might be shopping at a luxury department store in the heart of Union Square, but he was happy with a low-key lifestyle. He had been enjoying living like the rich and famous for the past six days though. Being holed up in Silas's condo hadn't been as bad as he'd thought it would be. It sure beat following cheating husbands around the city. He couldn't complain about his bodyguard duties. He had access to an unlimited number of TV channels, a beautiful view of the sunrise and sunset every day, and a selection of gourmet meals prepared daily by the building's catering kitchen. Of course, Natasha's company made the time go by faster as well. They ate their meals together and talked about music, both classical pieces and current hits on the radio. Their afternoons were spent in the building's gym or side by side on the couch reading or surfing the internet. They watched movies in the evening, sharing popcorn and candy like two teenagers on a date. Being with Natasha made him feel young and carefree again. Even shopping was fun as long as he could share the experience with her. He realized he missed her presence already. He quickly gathered up the two other pairs of pants he'd chosen, along with a couple of shirts and essentials, and exited the stall. Walking along the wooden floors that reflected the bright lights overhead, he made his way to the jewelry section where Natasha said she'd be. He had hesitated to leave her out of his sight, but she'd reasoned that she was more than safe in a store with their own set of security guards. He had agreed, knowing there were multiple pairs of eyes on the lookout. Yet, he wouldn't feel at peace until Natasha was within arm's reach again. He smiled at the thought of her in that crazy tiger print outfit she'd had on the other day. What was even crazier was the fact that he'd gone into Tony Tiger mode and said something so childish. The last time he'd done something that silly was when he played with his young niece and nephew. That had been years ago before he left the force and isolated himself from everyone, including his family. He couldn't remember the last time his younger sister had called him or sent him pictures of the kids. He didn't blame her though, 
communication required effort on both sides. Perhaps now was the time to put in that effort and reconnect with them. Victor walked with purpose in his steps, his shoulders back and chin up. For the first time in a long while, he felt excited about life. There was something to look forward to, namely someone to look forward to seeing. An image of Natasha's bright green eyes and full, pink lips came to mind. He couldn't deny her effect on him, his mood, his outlook, and his body. Being near this woman did something to him. His senses seemed sharpened in a way he'd never experienced before. This wasn't a matter of being aware of his surroundings, like he had to be as a cop or P.I., this was so much more. Like a rebirth of sorts. His heart seemed to be beating with more fervor, he was breathing more freely and smiling like he meant it. For once, he felt happy. God had saved him from his sins then from a bullet. Victor sensed he was saving him yet again, this time from himself. All thanks to Natasha. As he rounded the corner, he caught sight of her petite frame leaning against the jewelry counter. Wearing her newly bought outfit of a cropped emerald green sweater and jeans that hugged her long legs, she was talking animatedly with a red-headed salesperson. Victor's heart jolted to life, beating strong and sure. He suddenly had an urge to take Natasha in his arms. To get lost in the scent of her jasmine perfume, the sweet fragrance that hung in the air long after she left the room. Being with her was so easy. He felt like his old self again, something he didn't think would be possible. And now he considered more possibilities, of spending more days with Natasha, of a lifetime with her by his, scoffing, he shook his head free of these crazy thoughts. What was he doing? This was an assignment, a job. One he needed his whole focus for. He couldn't risk jeopardizing Natasha's safety over some feelings. No matter how strong and real those feelings were. Those warm emotions disappeared when he spotted a tall figure approaching the jewelry counter. The man looked to be in his mid to late twenties with a head of dark hair and a defined jawline. His sports jacket and dress pants gave him a professional appearance. He walked with his hands in his pockets, heading straight for Natasha. When he reached her side, he gave her a flirtatious smile and began chatting her up. Victor's body went into high alert, his heart pounding and palms clammy. He didn't know what it was, but something about this guy didn't sit well with him. He'd seen plenty of criminals in his lifetime and could spot them in a lineup with a surprising rate of accuracy. Nick had always said God had given him the male equivalent of female intuition. At this moment, all signs pointed to this stranger being bad news. He quickened his steps and reached Natasha's side, wedging himself in between her and the stranger. He threw his arm over her shoulder, the movement feeling as natural for him as it did when they were dating. Hey, baby, sorry, I took so long. I finally figured out which shirts I want. Natasha stiffened at his contact and turned to him in surprise. Once she realized it was Victor, she relaxed and flashed him a curious smile. No worries. I was just helping this gentleman here with a gift for his wife. It's their anniversary today. The man gave Victor a curt nod, his dark eyes narrowing. Hey there. Happy anniversary. Jewelry's always a safe bet to go with. Victor did his best to appear calm, keeping his tone light as he tried to strike up a conversation. All the while, he gave the guy a thorough once-over and took some mental notes. Up close, he spotted a dimple in his chin and a scar along his left cheek. Despite his nice clothes, 
he didn't appear to be someone who'd be shopping at Barney's on a Monday morning. So, how long have you been married? A muscle in his jaw twitched as he answered, five years. That's great, man. You're way ahead of us. We just got married recently. Victor pulled Natasha close and gave her a quick kiss on the head. He reasoned that he was acting this way to get this guy to back off, but he had to admit he enjoyed being near her again. Rubbing a protective hand along Natasha's upper arm, he added, we'd love any pointers you could give us. Just to help us newlyweds out. It's so hard to stay married these days. Any words of wisdom would be appreciated. A look of discomfort crossed the man's face. He shrugged and backed away a few steps. You know what they say, communicate, don't go to bed mad, that kind of thing. Thanks for the help. I gotta go. What about the gift? Natasha piped up. I was going to suggest the ruby earrings. I just remembered I bought her jewelry last year. I'll go with flowers this time. He spun around on his heels and strode quickly toward the exit without a look back. Victor released a heavy breath, the tension in his body falling away. He turned toward Natasha, locking gazes with her. You okay? Yeah, I'm fine. Her eyes widened as she studied his face. Are you okay? You look pale. I was worried about you. He lightened his tone when he realized the salesperson was observing their exchange. With a chuckle, he remarked to the young woman, new husband nerves. I have a hard time being apart from this amazing woman. Aren't you too sweet, the young woman cooed. Sighing happily, she glanced from Victor to Natasha and back again. I hope I find a guy like you someday. All the ones I've met online are just so, she shuddered as she tried to think of the right words. Stinky and slimy. Natasha finished for her. Yes. She rolled her eyes. You're so lucky to have found a good one. Natasha flashed Victor a sweet smile, her eyes never leaving his face as she said three simple words, that he is. Victor swallowed slowly. All the noise surrounding them, the other customers' footsteps and conversations, faded away as he found himself completely mesmerized by Natasha's mouth. The dip of her cupid's bow, the curve of her pink lips, and the way they parted slightly in a welcoming smile, he couldn't tear his eyes away. Under different circumstances, he would take his chances and kiss her right then and there. He almost gave in to his desire, that is until she dropped her gaze. He quickly blinked and shook himself free of his daydreaming. You guys are so cute. Anyone looking at you guys can see you're in love. With one hand placed over her heart, the saleswoman swooned. She turned to Victor with an eager smile. Do you want to see the necklace your wife was looking at? It would go perfectly with her eyes. Oh, that's not necessary, Natasha spoke up as she stepped out from under his arm. I wasn't planning on buying it. Let's see it, please. Victor nodded at the salesperson who obliged and unlocked the glass case. She pulled out a necklace hanging from a black velvet stand and placed it on the counter. The gold oval link chain boasted five pear-shaped charms, each consisting of an emerald and a small round diamond at the top. The light green stones shone brilliantly, reminding him of the beautiful sparkle in Natasha's eyes. The necklace suited her well with its delicate yet eye-catching details. Without hesitation, he stated, you're right. This is perfect. I'll take it. Victor. 
Natasha exclaimed, you don't have to. I want to buy it for you. He was about to hand over his credit card when she grabbed his arm and pulled him aside. Where are we going? Natasha stared up at him with wide eyes as they stopped next to a rack of colorful scarves. There's no one around now, she remarked in a hushed voice. You can stop pretending. Pretending. Victor repeated, confused. She gestured to the both of them. The husband and wife act. It's not April Fool's Day anymore. Do you realize you almost bought a $6,000 necklace? His jaw dropped in disbelief. That was the cost of three months' rent for his one-bedroom apartment. I, uh, guess I forgot to check the price. I thought it would make a nice birthday gift for you, he added with chagrin. Her eyes brightened. That's so sweet of you, Victor. I really appreciate the thought. You always did have a big heart. He shrugged off her compliment, feeling far from admirable. Forget about his heart, he was completely out of his mind. How could he have gotten so caught up in role-playing that he'd almost dropped a pretty penny on a piece of jewelry? It was time to get his head back in the game, especially when they were out in public. Anyone could be a suspect. He had to stop letting his feelings cloud his judgment. Reeling in his emotions, he took a step back to distance himself from Natasha. The only way to guarantee her safety was to guard his heart. Because if she ever got hurt on his watch, he'd never forgive himself. Chapter 11 Natasha Natasha walked through the front doors of the rec center with Victor trailing behind. Her high-heeled boots clicked against the concrete, the sound bouncing off the walls covered with bulletin boards. Colorful flyers were tacked onto the corkboard, announcing new after-school classes and tutoring programs. At the end of the short hallway, a light shone from a partially open door, and the sounds of children's laughter and chatter resounded. The joyful noises made Natasha's heart swell. Even though she'd seen the kids a week ago, she missed them already. They were the much-needed remedy for the craziness of the past few days. She glanced over her shoulder, pausing to wait for Victor. The hard edges of his face made her chest tighten. Something was up with him. Ever since they'd left the department store, he'd been silent and brooding. She sure missed the glimpse of the old Victor she saw when he'd been role-playing her husband. The way he'd kissed her head had sent a long-forgotten thrill through her body. His actions were so natural and sure she'd almost believe they were real. His expression now though was formal and distant. He was such an enigma, much more guarded than he'd been in the past. She was sure, however, that five minutes with the kids would turn his mood around. She hoped so, because she didn't think she could stand being around his grumpy self for much longer. Victor, before we go in, I'd like to make a suggestion, she stated as he neared. It would help if you'd smile a little when you see the kids. The way you look now could come across as intimidating. A muscle in his jaw clenched as he stared down at her. He sighed deeply and crossed his arms against his chest. His biceps bulged against the fabric of his long-sleeved shirt as a silent warning to anyone who might cross him. I'm a bodyguard, Tasha. It's my job to look intimidating. I know. But if you go into that room looking like the Terminator, you're gonna have to deal with Mrs. D. And trust me, you don't want to get on her bad side. She runs this place on sunshine and smiles, so you'll be getting extra hugs if she thinks you need them. Which you obviously do. So, give me a smile, please. I know you've got it in you. You did a great job role-playing at the store earlier. 
he furrowed his brows. That guy really rubbed me the wrong way for some reason. I had no choice but to step in. I figured as much. I really appreciate you watching out for me. Now let me do something for you. Taking two steps forward, she closed the gap between them. The masculine scent of his cologne filled her senses, making her stomach dip. The stern look on his face however brought her back to reality. He definitely needed an intervention. She placed her hands on his forearms and frowned when he flinched at her touch. Wow, maybe he really did need a hug or two. She slowly pushed his arms to his sides, softening her tone as she remarked, You can relax. This is a safe place. Victor rolled his eyes, his lips unmoving. He huffed and pulled away from her reach, but he managed to lift the corners of his mouth. The effort vaguely resembled a smile, although his dark eyes showed otherwise. Happy now. Natasha burst out laughing. She couldn't help it. The dull, flat tone he used was anything but happy. That's better. Like this much better, she held up her index finger and thumb a centimeter apart, but I appreciate the effort. Come on, let's get in there before you have a chance to frown again. She grabbed him by the hand and pulled him down the hall. All right, all right. I'm coming, Victor insisted as he dragged his feet behind her. His large hand rested limply in hers, barely holding on. For someone who's got muscles for days, you sure have a weak grip, she teased him. Are you afraid I'll give you cooties? An unreadable emotion flickered in his eyes, disappearing when he blinked. With a smirk, he replied, I'm immune to anything you might throw my way, especially cooties. You're obviously not immune to my positivity. See, you're smiling already, she exclaimed. She raised her free hand in a victory pose as they approached the open door. She tugged him through and gave him a winning grin as they entered the room. Several children who were sitting at a long table dropped their pencils and papers and rushed over. Timmy, her prized piano student, was the first to reach them. He peered up, his blue eyes widening in awe at Victor's tall stature. Whoa, who are you? Boys and girls, I want you to meet a special friend of mine. Natasha announced. This is Mr. Victor. I hope you'll all welcome him and make him feel at home. She pulled him toward a pint-sized plastic chair and gestured for him to sit down. Why don't you read the kids a story? What? Me? He stuttered. I don't think so. Please, Timmy, piped up, his tone emphatic. He brought a book over to Victor and found a seat on the braided rug at the foot of the chair. Can you read this to us? Alexander and the Terrible, Horrible, No Good, Very Bad Day. Victor flashed Natasha a desperate look, his knees folded awkwardly to accommodate the small seat. I don't read stories out loud. You can do it. This book needs someone who's good at sounding grumpy to read it. You're the perfect candidate. Natasha winked at him, secretly enjoying seeing him squirm. She stepped off to the side to give him the spotlight. Just give it a try. Victor's face flushed red as he opened the book. In a gravelly voice, he began reading with as much enthusiasm as a kid talking about his visit to the dentist. He dragged out each word with dramatic effect, perfectly portraying the main character's woe-is-me attitude. A dozen more kids noticed him reading and ran over to take their places on the rug. A sea of expectant faces looked up at Victor as he read. Natasha's heart warmed as the minutes passed. Victor's voice, 
his intonation and timbre, was perfect for this book. She watched the kids sit still, their legs crossed and back straight as they listened intently to his every word. Soon enough, Victor also straightened his posture and began loosening up. With each page he turned, he became more at ease. Toward the middle of the story, he had a genuine grin on his face. At the end, he closed the book and lifted his gaze. His eyes immediately sought out hers. The pride and joy on his face made Natasha tear up. Seeing him happy made her happy. At this point, she could no longer deny what her heart already knew, she was still hopelessly in love with Victor. Before she could dwell on this thought, Mrs. D. came up beside her and pulled her into a warm embrace. Natasha, you're an answer to prayer, she exclaimed, taking a step back to look her in the eyes. You should have heard me scream when I got your email. We can't thank you enough. Your generous donation has saved the rec center. Humbled, Natasha shook her head. It's actually the other way around. You and the children have saved me. This is the least I can do to show my appreciation. Nonsense. You're doing a great thing, don't let anyone tell you otherwise. She gave Natasha a soft pat on the cheek like a proud mother. I must ask though, how did you manage to come up with the money, and so quickly, too? I hope this didn't put you in any type of hardship. It's a long story, but just know that God provided a way. It was no trouble at all, she answered firmly. It was the truth. She didn't consider marrying Victor a hardship at all. She glanced over at him, pleased to see him interacting with several of the kids. A young girl with pigtails pulled on one of his arms to hand him a book while a little boy hung on the other like he was a monkey bar. The sight made her insides melt. Mrs. D followed her gaze, her brows raised in surprise. Who do we have here? Is he a new volunteer? He's a friend, Natasha murmured, her voice breathless. His name's Victor. Hmm, it seems he's living up to his name. He's conquered a heart already. She gave her a pointed look. Is it that obvious? She could feel her cheeks warming up. No doubt they were as pink as Mrs. D's bright striped top. We dated before, but it didn't work out. We're just friends, now. Mrs. D's expression softened. Well, if the spark was there once, it can certainly return. He's so good with the children. I'd try to hold on to this one, if I were you. Natasha nodded. Funny how she and Victor were married, but there was no guarantee of a happy ending. Oh, but how she hoped and prayed for one. Victor met her gaze across the room, an awkward smile on his face as he tried to escape the kids surrounding him. He pointed to his watch and mouthed, we should go, before standing up. He waved goodbye to the children, receiving some high-pitched whines in return. Mrs. D quickly marched over to calm down the crowd, but not before she extended her arms to Victor and hugged him tight. His eyes widened in surprise as Mrs. D whispered in his ear before pulling away. Victor glanced over at Natasha, his cheeks reddening. Mrs. D shooed him off playfully and he quickly strode over to Natasha's side with a sheepish smile. What was that about? Natasha asked, eager to find out about their secret exchange. Nothing much. She said she was happy to meet me. He fished his car keys from his back pocket and gave the room a cursory glance. I'll go get the car. Stay here until I text you to come out. I'll just come with you. He shook his head firmly. I need you to stay put. 
you'll be safer here. She balked. I'm not going to get lost, especially not with the tracking app you put on my phone. The less time you spend in public, the better. I need you to trust me, Tasha, he pleaded. Why don't you use this time to say goodbye to the kids? Okay, fine. Natasha watched him walk off, certain he was making a big deal out of nothing. Sure, they had parked a couple of blocks away, but it was still bright out. She was more likely at risk of getting mugged on the streets of San Francisco than face the wrath of a stalker. Rolling her eyes, she gave in to Victor's suggestion. She went around to her piano students, giving them some quick pointers on what to practice for the recital. Once she had finished making her rounds, she took her phone out of her purse. Still no text from Victor. Certainly, it wouldn't do any harm for her to wait for him outside. She stepped through the main exit and out onto the busy sidewalk, immediately feeling a cold breeze blow through her hair. Pulling her hair to one side over her shoulder, she glanced around for any signs of Victor's sedan. Soon, a black car came peeling around the corner and slowed to a halt about five feet from her. The scene was so reminiscent of their meeting a week ago, Natasha almost laughed. Victor had the same intense expression, yet she knew there was so much more under his facade. She crossed her eyes and stuck her tongue out, hoping to make him smile. Her action only served to make him more cross. Her heart sank as his features hardened. She quickly sobered up as she hurried to his car, dreading the lecture coming her way. Chapter 12 Victor Victor could hardly keep his emotions in check. What was Natasha doing, disobeying his orders? He worked his jaw stewing in so much anger he wouldn't be surprised if there was steam coming from his ears. Flashing her a look of disdain, he barked, What were you thinking? What part of stay put didn't you understand? Natasha's eyes widened, her pupils dilated. I understood what you said. I just, I thought it'd be easier this way. I was already done talking with the kids, and you hadn't texted yet, so I came out to look for you. I was fine, you were lucky. He cut her off with a wave of his hand. A car behind them honked, reminding him he was blocking traffic. He stepped on the gas, all the while gritting his teeth. You were lucky, I lost the car that had been tailing me for the past few blocks. And you were lucky, I got here, just as you walked out. But you might not be so lucky next time. That's why you need to listen to me. I'm your bodyguard, Natasha, not your babysitter. I have reasons for the things I say and do. I can't keep you safe if you put yourself in danger. She turned to him, her complexion pale. Was it the same car that followed us last week? Despite his anger, he softened a bit when he heard the trembling in her voice. I believe so. It was the same make and model, and the driver was also wearing dark shades. But how did he find us? He released a heavy breath, frustrated at her naivety. If he found out where you live, he can easily find out where you go day to day. He already knows your schedule. This means the rec center is off limits now. It's not safe for you to keep going there. But I told the kids I'd be back tomorrow. I already didn't get a chance to hear them play today since we had to leave so soon. And the recitals on Friday. How can I help them prepare if I can't go in? Victor slowed the car as they neared an intersection with a pedestrian scramble zone. He watched as traffic in all four directions stopped to allow people, both tourists and businessmen and women, to cross the street horizontally, vertically, 
and diagonally at the same time. The image brought a thought to mind. Perhaps Natasha needed a visual explanation for the dangerous situation she was in because she obviously didn't heed auditory advice. Praying for patience, he turned to face her. You see this intersection. He motioned toward the windshield. It was designed to keep pedestrians safe. But it only works if the people on the sidewalk wait for the signal to go. One step too early or too late could result in a catastrophe. There's no room for debate here. Obey the signal light and you'll be safe. Disobey it and you put yourself in danger. Does this make sense? Yes, but, there are no buts. It's either yes or no. Sighing, she furrowed her brows. I wish you wouldn't treat me like a child. I've survived on my own in this city for the past five years. I carry two cans of pepper spray in my purse, and I know how to get out of a headlock. My brother taught me how to protect myself. I'm not a child, Victor. I'm a grown woman. That was an understatement. The pout she was flashing his way appeared more sexy than innocent. And the curves of her body, he swallowed hard, tearing his eyes away to focus on the road. He accelerated as the light changed to green. I know you're not a child. You're old enough to be married. Exactly. You should know, you married me. He scoffed at the incredulity of the statement. Was that pride he heard in her voice? Surely, it was due to the fact that she was winning this argument, not because she was proud to be his wife. He shook his head, wishing the latter thought didn't make him as happy as it did. He had to stop letting Natasha get under his skin. We're not really married. Technically, we are. So I'd appreciate being treated as an equal in this relationship. He scoffed. Relationship? When had they returned to having a relationship? The only relationship we have is as bodyguard and client. Your uncle hired me to protect you, Natasha, not to be your shopping buddy. Natasha inhaled sharply. Crossing her arms across her chest, she stared ahead. A minute passed in silence. When she finally spoke, her voice was soft and low. I forgot you were only spending time with me because you had to. It was stupid of me to think we were friends again. Victor snuck a glance at her, surprised to hear her sniffling. Was she crying? Maybe he had gone too far in setting his boundaries. I didn't mean it like that. Then how did you mean it? she asked, her tone hesitant yet challenging. I, it's complicated. He ran a hand roughly through his hair, pulling at the ends in frustration. How could he explain this to Natasha without revealing too much? It's easier if I distance myself from you emotionally. As much as I'd like to let myself feel, it's safer not to. He clamped his mouth shut, hoping his explanation worked. He gripped the steering wheel, eyes focused on the road as he changed lanes. He prayed for a quick drive back to the condo, as much for their safety as for his sanity. This conversation was getting too personal for his liking. She turned to face him, quietly studying him before asking, what emotions would you feel if you did let yourself feel them? It doesn't matter what I feel. Natasha sighed, the sound a mixture of sadness and pity. I think you've forgotten how to listen to your heart. It's like you wrapped a bulletproof vest around it ever since Nikki died. But I know it's alive and beating inside of you. I saw glimpses of it this past week. Whenever I got you to laugh. When you did your Tony the Tiger imitation. She paused to smile. 
You let yourself feel those times, I know you did. I also felt it when you were protecting me at the store. I felt your care for me. Why would you want to deny that? Wouldn't feeling those things help you do your job better? It's natural to want to protect someone you care about. Victor clenched his jaw. He didn't need to see her eyes to know they were locked on him, peering past his defenses. It was getting harder and harder to hold his cards close to his chest. Natasha had an intense yet gentle way about her that made him want to open up. But he didn't dare go deep. He simply gave a nonchalant shrug, hoping it would put an end to her questioning. Natasha didn't back down as he'd hoped. Instead, she chose to dive deeper. In case you can't tell, I still care about you, too, deeply. This is one crazy mess we're in, but I'm thankful to the Lord to be in it with you. Her tone was so pure and sweet, he couldn't help but feel it penetrating into his inner being. That meant the protection Natasha spoke of, the Kevlar around his heart, was disintegrating. The only thing that could break through was the one thing he feared feeling the most. Love. He didn't know what love felt like anymore. Sure, he'd felt Natasha's love for him long ago. And just now at the rec center, he had seen it in the eyes of the children who'd welcomed him with such enthusiasm and warmth. But he didn't deserve their kindness. Just as he didn't deserve Natasha's. He let go of the steering wheel with his right hand and rested it on the center console. He gripped the cold, hard plastic edge, channeling all his weariness and frustration into his clenched fist. Why couldn't Natasha leave him alone? He wasn't like one of her students at the rec center. It was no use helping him. As if she could read his mind, she reached over and covered his hand. The warmth of her palm sent a soothing sensation over his skin like a healing balm. Her strong, tapered fingers pressed down gently until they interlaced his own. Her hand rested there, bringing him comfort that tingled up his arm, spread through his shoulder and chest, and seeped into his soul. I feel like there's a reason our paths crossed again after all these years. Maybe it's so I could help you learn to start living again. He blinked back, the hot tears moistening his eyes. He didn't dare speak for his voice would certainly reveal his emotions. The only saving grace was the fact that they were now turning into the building's underground garage, and he'd be able to escape her presence soon. After they passed the security checkpoint, he pulled into the nearest parking space. Needing his right hand to shift gears, he cleared his throat and began pulling his hand out from under hers. Natasha realized his intent and quickly let go. Sorry, it just felt so comfortable. I didn't mean to take your hand hostage. Oh, that's probably not the best word to use right now, she added with chagrin. He turned off the engine, his heart pounding at the implications of that one word. Something woke up inside him, prompting him to reach for Natasha's arm. She paused, one hand on the door handle. Her green eyes, illuminated by the bright LED light outside their car, shone with surprise. Yes. The uncertainty in her voice made his chest tighten. After all Natasha had said and done to try to bring him out of his shell, he had never said anything nice to her. The least he could do was acknowledge her kindness. I just wanted to say thank you for being a good friend. I haven't felt this alive in a long time. Her eyes lit up with joy and relief. You don't know how happy I am to hear that. Without hesitation, she reached up over the center console and wrapped her arms around his neck. Victor immediately relaxed in her embrace, breathing in the sweet scent of her shampoo. 
he cradled her tightly to his chest and rested his chin on her head. Even as he held her, he knew he was crossing the line he had carefully put in place. For this wasn't an act of a bodyguard holding his client but one of a man holding the woman he had missed for five years, and still desperately loved. He pulled back slowly to gaze into Natasha's eyes, mesmerized by their unique color. They were like two cool pools, waiting for him to dive in and forget all his cares. He ran one thumb down her soft cheek before his eyes dropped to her mouth. Her perfect lips had spoke truth into his being and made him believe in love. A longing grew in him to see if they tasted as sweet as they once did. He leaned in and brushed his mouth ever so gently against hers, quieting the breathy sigh that escaped. Surprise flickered in his mind as he realized the kiss he had entertained was actually happening. Natasha, however, didn't hesitate to react. She wove her fingers into his hair and pulled him close, returning his kiss with an intensity that made him heat up. The way her soft curves melted into his torso sent a wave of passion through his veins and made him grateful they were legally wed in God's eyes. Because the desires filling his mind in that moment were only meant for husband and wife. As much as he wanted to give in, to show Natasha how much he cherished her, he knew better. They might be married, but there was a lot to sort through. Their relationship was complicated to say the least, especially given the circumstances. Rushing would only make things worse. He determined to treat her with the respect and care she deserved. Pulling back from her honey-sweet mouth, he murmured, Tasha, we should slow down. Her face paled, uncertainty clouding her eyes. I, I thought you wanted the kiss. I do. I did. But under the circumstances, it's not a good idea, she shook her head in protest. Stop, please stop. I get it. You don't have to explain again. I'm your client, and you're my bodyguard. End of story. She grabbed her purse and rushed out of the car, promptly slamming the door. Victor sat in stunned silence watching her run toward the residential lobby, then disappear through the sliding glass doors as they opened and shut. Chapter 13 Natasha Natasha slumped against the elevator wall, her knees threatening to buckle beneath her. She placed a hand on the glass wall to steady herself as the elevator began its ascent to the condo. The numbers along the top of the doors lit up in quick succession, while the elevator flew past the floors containing office spaces. Her stomach sank, as much from the upward motion as from the pain of rejection. How could she have been so naive? The only reason Victor had stuck around this past week was for the money he would receive, both from her uncle and herself. She'd been foolish to think he had actually enjoyed spending time with her. And that amazing, mind-blowing moment they shared. It was likely the role-playing Victor had done earlier or their close proximity in the car that led him to kiss her. Whatever love spell he'd been under was long gone. Broken like her heart. Swiping a hand across her eyes, she wiped away the tears gathering there. She glanced up at the ceiling, wondering what Nikki must be thinking about her predicament now. If only she could talk to him and ask for advice. Not that she was all that good at taking suggestions or orders, for that matter. Nikki always said she was too headstrong for her own good. Apparently, Victor thought so, too. She cringed, remembering the anger on his face. She thought she had helped to soften him and turn his attitude around this past week, but the effects obviously hadn't lasted. Not even his interaction with the kids at the rec center had made a difference. He was still as bitter and unhappy as ever. The thought made her want to cry even more. 
She choked back a sob, determined not to let him see her upset. If they were going to be stuck in the condo together for the unforeseeable future, she would do her best to act normal. Focus on keeping her distance physically and not let herself get attached to Victor emotionally. She prayed for strength to stick to her new game plan. The elevator slowly came to a stop at the 60th floor, prompting her to take a deep breath. She readied herself as the doors opened, knowing it wouldn't be long before Victor caught up to her. Natasha threw her purse strap over her shoulder then stepped out. An unexpected chill ran down her back as the doors closed behind her. She didn't know what it was, but something didn't feel right. Maybe Victor's paranoia was rubbing off on her. She did a visual sweep of the area, something she saw Victor do whenever he entered a place. She glanced to her right where a six-foot-tall turquoise pane of glass stood, taking up the entire wall. The sound of flowing water from this indoor waterfall normally soothed her, but even it couldn't stop her heart from pounding. Next to the waterfall was their personal concierge desk that was manned during business hours. Instead of a balding, middle-aged man named Paul, Natasha was surprised to see a dark-haired, younger man, sitting in his place. He wore a similar uniform of a black tuxedo with a gray vest, black bow tie, and white gloves. With a quick nod, he acknowledged Natasha's arrival. She squeezed out a smile, assuming the two employees had traded shifts. While she didn't recognize this man, there was something familiar about him. Maybe she had seen him around the building and she and Victor had taken a tour of the place. Speaking of Victor, she wondered why he hadn't made it up yet. She glanced behind her at the elevators and noticed that both were stopped at the ground floor. He was likely boarding one of them now. She turned back around and decided to head to the condo first. All she wanted to do was throw on a pair of leggings and a t-shirt and drown her sorrows listening to Mozart. As she reached the large door with its marble frame, she heard the echo of footsteps behind her. Had Victor arrived? She hadn't even heard the elevator doors open. Not wanting to face him just yet, she kept her head down as she drew her key card out of her purse. Before she could swipe it along the door handle, however, she felt the blunt tip of a metal object at her waist. She gasped and froze in place as hot breath assaulted her cheek. A male voice whispered, Hello, Miss Livingston, and prodded her back with what she now realized was a gun. Out of the corner of her eye, she saw a flash of dark brown hair and a scar. One raised red ridge along the man's left cheek. Chills ran down her back as recognition dawned on her. This was the man from Barney's. But what was he doing here, with a gun, no less? She bit the inside of her cheek to keep from screaming. Where was Victor when she needed him? What was taking him so long? She berated herself for running off without him and straight into danger. This was exactly what he had been warning her about. She may have escaped harm earlier today, but she had walked head-on into it now. She was in the worst trouble she'd ever been in. Even her cans of mace and self-defense skills didn't stand a chance against a deadly weapon. Not knowing what else to do, she prayed for courage and the right words to say to stall for time. With great effort, she kept her voice even and light. Hey, fancy running into you again. How did your anniversary go? Did you end up getting flowers for your wife? The man scoffed as he grabbed both of her hands and held them behind her back. The key card fell from her grip as he tied her hands together. Did you really believe that story? I made the whole thing up. There is no wife. 
but wait until I get my hands on that money that's rightfully mine, and I'll have girls lined up out the door. Brittany will be sorry, she dumped me. Natasha flinched as the rope around her wrists cut into her skin. Despite the pain, she channeled her focus on his words. Anything he said could be a clue to who he was and why he was after her. I'm sorry about Brittany. I know how it feels to have the person you love leave you. You? You have no idea how that feels. You've got money, and you're married. Where's your husband anyway? I, I don't know. The barrel of the gun dug into the small of Natasha's back as the man growled. Don't play around with me. Your husband, where is he? Natasha desperately wished she knew the answer to that question, too. Scared and helpless, she shook her head. I told you, I know what it feels like to get dumped. He doesn't want me anymore. He just wanted the money. Hearing the words out loud made the realization even more gut-wrenching. A sob escaped her lips before she could stop it. The man jerked her around to face him. He stuck his pointy nose in her face and studied her with narrowed eyes. His expression softened a bit when he saw the tears falling down her face. Either you're a really good actor, or you're telling me the truth. Which is it? It's the truth, she stated as she blinked back her tears. He only married me for the money. He cackled loudly, his mouth opened wide to reveal a set of yellow, cigarette-stained teeth. Who would have guessed I'd have something in common with a rich person? People are all the same, no matter how much money they have. Never satisfied, always wanting more isn't that right? Even love isn't enough. His expression sobered. That's why I need money. And you're going to help me get it. Natasha felt a surge of hope at his last comment. If it's money you want, I can get it for you. A million. Two million. Name your price. Now we're talking. He turned her around and prodded her back again with the gun, forcing her to walk toward the elevator. I've got a whole list of things I'm going to need, and your uncle's going to get them for me. My uncle? How do you know my uncle? I don't personally, but I know the kind of man he is. The kind that goes around ruining people's lives. If he wants to see you alive again, he better do what I say, and leave the cops out of it. No funny business from you either. I hear you. All right then, come on. We're gonna get me away out of here. Some place with a nice view of the city where a helicopter can land. He pushed the elevator call button. Natasha held her breath as the number panel lit up. One of the cars reached their floor within 30 seconds, filling her with hope. When the doors opened to an empty elevator, however, her stomach sank. The situation was getting bleaker by the minute. With a gun to her back, she had no choice but to enter and desperately pray for Victor to find her. Chapter 14 Victor Victor set down his empty glass on the black granite countertop of the lobby's bar. He checked his watch, noting that ten minutes had passed since Natasha ran off from his car. While he'd followed her inside, he was ashamed to admit he'd dragged his feet. He was now biding his time as he contemplated how he was going to fix things with her. During his time on the force, he'd come face to face with countless criminals, and even taken part in a raid to take down a drug lord. He'd talked and fought his way out of dangerous situations. But never in his life had he felt more ill-equipped than he did now. 
How could he approach Natasha when all she'd wanted to do was get as far away from him as possible? The staff member behind the counter walked over with a tall glass bottle. He wore the customary uniform of a black tuxedo, which contrasted with his head of white hair and equally white, bushy eyebrows. More sparkling water, Mr. Price. Sighing, Victor shook his head. No, thanks, I'm good. He cocked his head to the side as he glanced around the upscale lounge area, wondering if he heard the sound of Natasha's boots on the marble floor. His face fell when a couple walked in and sat at one of the tables behind him. Another man and woman strode by in their name-brand athletic gear on their way to the gym. Seeing the latter couple reminded him of the last time he and Natasha had worked out together. They had taken a spin class on Peloton bikes that cost around $2,000 a pop. Natasha had worn a form-fitting purple tank top and matching leggings, both of which showed off her feminine curves. He'd been grateful they hadn't needed to watch where they were going because he hadn't been able to take his eyes off her. With sweat glistening on her face and strands of hair falling out of her high ponytail, she had looked like a million bucks. And when she flashed him a competitive grin as she pumped her legs in double time, he couldn't help grinning back. Natasha was the most beautiful and amazing woman he'd ever known. He felt like he'd won the biggest lottery imaginable with her by his side, she was so precious and valuable. How could he relay to her how he felt? I hope you'll excuse my intrusion, sir, the bartender spoke up suddenly, but I couldn't help but notice that you and Ms. Livingston came in separately. Victor almost laughed. He supposed it didn't take an investigator to determine that he and Natasha were on the outs. Yes. Things are a bit complicated for us at the moment. May I be so bold as to offer you a suggestion, sir? He gave him a tight-lipped smile, not sure how this man could help, but surely any idea was better than none. Please. I could use all the help I can get. The older man reached under the counter and brought out a tall round black box filled to the brim with roses. He set the bouquet of around five dozen vibrant red buds on the counter. With a wave of his white-gloved hand, he announced, Roses. You can never go wrong with flowers. These were hand-picked ones from the mountains of Ecuador and preserved at a special atelier here in the States. They are guaranteed to last up to a year, long after the two of you will have patched things up. A sweet floral fragrance filled Victor's senses, giving him a heady sensation. Or maybe it was the thought of how much this bouquet likely cost. He'd given Natasha roses once though when they were dating, and she'd loved them. She had said it was a really romantic gesture coming from a tough guy like him. Victor nodded as he thought. If romance spoke to Natasha, he would do romance. Buy her the roses and present them to her, along with some sincere words from his heart. I'll take them. Would you charge it to my tab? Yes, of course, sir. Victor took the box and proceeded to the elevator with brisk steps. Now that he was ready to face Natasha, he was eager to see her. It was time to find out if there was a possibility they could have a real future together, not one born out of convenience. Just as he boarded the elevator, his cell phone rang. Balancing the roses in one hand, he answered the call quickly when Sergeant O'Brien's name flashed across the screen. He hoped Sam had good news for him. Sam, tell me you got a lead. I did. We just learned that Milton Hayes had a longtime girlfriend on the side. The woman stepped forward when she realized he'd run off. Turns out they have a son together, Rocco's the name. He's the one who sent those threatening letters to the Livingstons. 
Rocco's after the money his dad is convinced Silas owes him, so he can take half of it. Victor shook his head in disgust. How convenient. Milton's off relaxing on a beach in Florida while his son does his dirty work for him. Yeah, well, he probably doesn't mind sacrificing a Father of the Year award for a couple million bucks. Sam laughed wryly. I've got my guys en route to check up on Rocco now. He's working downtown at some luxury condo. Trying to get a taste of the good life, no doubt. A chill traveled down Victor's back. Luxury condo. Which one? South of Market Street. You're not talking about 177 Durant, are you? There was a rustling of papers, before Sam answered, that's the one. Have you heard of it? Heard of it, I've been staying here, with Natasha this past week. You and Natasha. Sam asked, a smile evident in his voice. She's the assignment you were talking about. I always wondered why she asked about you so much. Sam, focus. You're saying the perp is here right now. Victor's eyes locked on the panel above the door, watching the numbers light up. His stomach twisted as he waited to reach the 60th floor. What's this guy look like? I need a photo. I'm on it. He paused then stated, sent. A new message with a photo attached popped up on Victor's phone screen. He nearly dropped the box of roses when he saw the man's face. Dark hair, brown eyes, and a dimpled chin, like father, like son. The man from Barney's was Milton's son, Rocco. A wave of anger washed over him, anger at this man for trying to get close to Natasha, but more so anger at himself for not having done more that day at the store. Why hadn't he followed the guy out and seen where he went? He could have at least gotten a description of his car, or maybe a license plate number. But no, he'd been too caught up playing make-believe and letting his emotions take over. And now the man targeting Natasha was in the same building as them. The elevator stopped its ascent, and the doors opened. Victor rushed out, his head whipping back and forth as he looked up and down the well-lit hallway. His heart just about stopped at the sight of the empty concierge desk, only to jumpstart again with a flood of adrenaline when he spotted a key card lying on the floor. Natasha. Where was she? He ran to the condo door, opened it, and did a quick sweep of the entire place. Sam called out for him over the phone, but Victor couldn't respond. His mind was wrapped up in the realization that Natasha was in danger, and it was all his fault. He needed to find her, fast. Sam, he's got her, he barked into the phone. I'm sure of it. We'll find her, Victor. My men are in the lobby now. Do you have any idea where he took her? Victor's brows shot up. Hold on, I can track her phone. He opened his tracking app, and a map of the area immediately appeared on the screen. He zoomed in on a bright green pushpin icon with Natasha's name on it. Next to it, a text bubble with the words, April 8th, 4.37 p.m., stated her real-time status at the location. Victor's heart soared with hope to know she was close by. She's at the Soma Transit Center next door. There's a sky bridge on the seventh floor that connects the buildings. I'm heading over now. Tell your team to meet me there. With a desperate prayer, Victor hung up and sprinted toward the elevator, abandoning the box of roses on the floor. His only mission now, to save the woman he loved. Chapter 15 Natasha. Natasha felt so sick she was sure she was going to lose her lunch. She bit down on her lower lip, 
forcing herself to keep her fears in check. With trembling steps, she inched toward the door leading to the skybridge connecting the condo with the structure next door. Under ordinary circumstances, she would never entertain the idea of crossing an open-air bridge 70 feet off the ground, much less do it. But this situation was anything but ordinary. For once, she feared something more than heights, the gun pointed at her back. Come on, what are you waiting for? The man who had taken her hostage had yet to share his name, choosing instead to bark out orders, one after the other. Let's go. I don't have all day. There's a cabana in Florida calling my name. Natasha winced as he prodded her forward with the gun between her shoulder blades. The man followed closely behind, using their bodies to shield the weapon from view. She kept her expression neutral so as to not attract attention from the people walking around the rooftop park on the other side. Her mind raced as she tried to remember any information Nikki had shared with her about hostage situations. Stay calm and listen. Empathize with the captor and build rapport. Above all, establish trust. With these points in mind, she did her best to sound enthusiastic in hopes of keeping the man talking. Florida. I hear it's beautiful there. I've never been, have you? No, but I've seen pictures. I'm sure I'll like it there especially with the cash your uncle transfers to my account. As soon as my ride arrives, I'll be on my way. Hot sand under my feet, an ice-cold drink in my hand, I'm set. Sounds nice. The man's plan did sound pleasant, assuming he could pull it off. Natasha had already contacted Uncle Silas with his demands, all of which her uncle had agreed to put into place. Ten million dollars, a getaway helicopter, and a new car for his mother. This last request surprised Natasha the most, but it also helped her to have compassion for the man. He was someone's son, possibly even someone's brother. Will your mom be joining you there? It's more fun, traveling with people. Just my dad. He scoffed loudly. I shouldn't be telling you so much. It's okay, I like listening. Go ahead, shoot. Natasha gasped at her word choice. I don't mean shoot in the literal sense. I meant feel free to share. I figured, he replied drolly. How about you? Any plans now that you're a single woman? If you're looking for a fun time, I wouldn't mind you coming along. The suggestive tone of his voice sent chills down Natasha's back. I'm technically not single yet. I'm still married on paper and in God's eyes, too. The truth of these words, however, brought her little comfort, knowing an annulment was in her future. That's too bad, the man answered, disappointed. His voice took on an edge again as he commanded her to keep moving. Open the door. With her hands tied, Natasha had no choice but to use her shoulder to push open the door. She stepped out into the cool air and squinted against the late afternoon sun. She focused her gaze straight in front of her and began walking. Out of the corners of her eyes, she spotted several plush recliner chairs placed in front of the large windows on both sides of the walkway. She trembled in her boots. Why anyone would risk their safety for a view of steel buildings was beyond her understanding. All she knew was that she needed to get off this bridge, fast. Beads of cold sweat broke out on her forehead and trickled down the sides of her face. Her hands grew clammy and her heart worked overtime, pounding with such intensity, she thought it might jump out of her chest. Lord, help me. These words played over and over in her mind at a frantic, dizzying pace while the world spun around her. 
An overwhelming sense of fear seized her body, paralyzing her. Natasha's knees buckled, propelling her forward. She cried out as she hit the cement floor, hard. Her body throbbed something terrible, especially her left side, which took the brunt of her fall. Pain seared her cheek, her skin feeling raw. With hot tears in her eyes, she struggled in vain to get up. Only when the gunman grabbed her arms and yanked her to her feet was she able to stand, what are you doing, he exclaimed, turning her around to face himself. One look at her, however, caused him to back away. He waved the gun wildly in the air as he demanded, oh, man. You better tell your uncle you did this to yourself. I don't want him thinking I hurt you. Natasha's eyes zeroed in on the metal barrel, her entire body shaking at the thought of the gun going off. Could she make an escape? What if he shot her? Was today the day she would be reunited with her parents and brother? These questions and more raced through her mind in rapid succession, overwhelming her to a point where she could hardly see straight. She felt like she was in a vacuum with no sound and very little air. Each labored breath was a desperate attempt to remain calm. To stay alive. As much as she wanted to be with God and her family, however, there was a part of her that wasn't ready. There was still so much work to be done. She had children to teach and nurture. A rec center to help grow. She had her own hopes and dreams of having a family of her own one day. Of sharing a future with the man she loved. Her eyes filled with tears. In the horror of the moment, her thoughts immediately turned to Victor. Oh, how she wished she could see him one more time, if only to wish him well. She'd also tell him how proud she was to have been his wife for a week. God must have answered her prayers because Victor seemed to materialize before her very eyes. She blinked quickly, wondering if stress was causing her to see things. No. It was Victor, standing at the edge of the skybridge, horror written all over his face. In a heartbeat, Victor charged forward and tackled the man from behind. His tall height and muscular build gave him a great advantage over the shorter, stockier man. He made quick work of disarming the gunman, grabbing his wrist and twisting his entire arm down and behind his back. The man crumpled and cried out in pain as the gun clattered on the ground. Not a second later, half a dozen SWAT members appeared on the scene. Dressed in all black, from their helmets to their boots, they approached with their rifles drawn. One of the men retrieved the weapon on the floor while two others ran up to cuff the gunman. Victor called out a word of thanks as they led him away before rushing to Natasha's side. Are you okay? He quickly worked to free Natasha's hands then winced when he saw her face. Oh, Tasha, you're hurt. It took a moment for Natasha to realize the ordeal was over. Her body still shook uncontrollably from the adrenaline flooding her system, but she knew she was safe. I, I fell, but I'm okay. She glanced around her, immediately regretting her decision. Squeezing her eyes shut, she declared, I'll feel even better once I get off this bridge. I've got you. Before she could react, Victor scooped her up into his arms in one easy motion. She opened her eyes to find herself inches from his face and the mouth she had kissed earlier. Her chest constricted to see the sadness in his dark brown eyes. She wished she could smooth away the worry lines on his forehead, but she didn't dare touch him. They were already too close for comfort. She could only lean into his chest and whisper, thank you for finding me, as he carried her to safety. Chapter 16 Victor Now that Natasha was within arm's reach, 
Victor could breathe a little easier. He knew from experience it would take an hour to fully recover from the adrenaline rush, but he focused on maintaining a calm, outer presence for her sake. She had just been through so much, and he wanted to do everything possible to help her feel safe. Victor spent the elevator ride back up to the condo bringing her up to speed on what he knew about the case. His main intent was to reassure her that the gunman had been working alone and they were clear of any more danger. Even still, when the doors opened on the 60th floor, he did a visual sweep of the area before stepping out. The old habit was as much for Natasha as for himself. He motioned for her to exit. All clear. Natasha took a tentative step out, then another and another. As soon as she walked out of the elevator, she looked toward the concierge desk. Her eyes lit up in recognition. Paul, it's so good to see you. Are you okay? The older man in uniform nodded. Yes, of course, Miss Livingston, Mr. Price. I apologize for stepping away earlier. I got called downstairs for an emergency which actually turned out to be a false alarm. Is there anything you need from me before I leave for the day? No, thank you, Victor replied with a shake of his head. Have a good evening. The older man bid them goodbye then boarded the waiting elevator. As Victor led Natasha down the hall, he couldn't help feeling tense. Yes, the gunman was out of the picture, but they still had an elephant in the room to deal with. It wouldn't be long before they would need to address the state of their relationship. What was he supposed to say then? His gaze fell to the box of roses sitting outside their condo door. He strode over quickly and pushed it to the side with his foot. The last thing he needed was for Natasha to see it. He wasn't in the right frame of mind to answer the questions she was bound to throw his way. Victor opened the door and ushered her inside. Why don't you sit down? I'll get the first aid kit from the bathroom. She nodded and sat down on the nearest sofa. He returned with the necessary supplies and took a seat beside her. Already petite in stature, she appeared even smaller and more fragile than usual. Victor had a strong urge to wrap her up in his arms and hold her. Instead, he kept his hands busy, cleaning her cheek and applying antibiotic ointment to her abrasions. Minutes passed as he worked in silence, all the while feeling her eyes just inches away, studying him. He wondered what was going through her mind, but he didn't dare ask. When she finally spoke up, her voice wavered with uncertainty. Those roses outside, were they for me? Victor sighed. So much for avoiding hard conversations. He set the tube of ointment on the crystal coffee table beside the sofa, weighing his answer carefully in his mind. Just an hour ago, everything had seemed as clear as that pane of glass. He was set on telling Natasha how he felt about her, that he wanted a future together. But that was before he let her walk head-on into danger. While he was taking his sweet time trying to figure out his feelings, she was fearing for her life, and he'd had no idea. That was the part that broke him the most. He'd had no idea she was scared out of her mind and facing her greatest fear, alone. He was the sorriest excuse for a bodyguard. Ashamed to meet her eyes, he stared down at his clenched fists. I'm sorry, I wasn't there for you, Tasha. I should have protected you. I let my guard down, and I failed you. I failed your uncle, Nick, all of you. And for that, I'll never forgive myself. His admission hung in the silence that followed, heavy and sad. Victor swallowed hard, wishing Natasha would say something yet fearing her reply. 
he didn't know if he could handle her disappointment. Yes, she'd been gracious in thanking him for coming to her rescue. But that was during the height of her emotions. Now that her shock was wearing off, she would realize how empty his promises had been. It was time to end this marriage and return to his solitary life. I'll sign the annulment papers whenever you want me to. Forget about paying me. I'm not taking your uncle's money either, so you can let him know. He didn't know what else to say. He didn't have the words to convey his regrets, so he said the words he wished he'd said years ago. I should never have loved you. Natasha finally spoke, her voice trembling. What are you talking about? Victor lifted his gaze, needing to look her in the eyes. He needed her to see how genuinely sorry he was for all the pain he'd caused her. Nick knew about us. That day he got shot, he gave me a good talking to and made sure I knew to treat you right. Then he joked that he'd have to work extra hard to keep me safe because you'd never forgive him if I got hurt. And that's what he did. He died trying to protect me. Natasha's mouth fell open in surprise. I can't believe he knew. He nodded. He overheard you talking to me on the phone. So he approved of us, she asked, her tone wistful. He shook his head in frustration. That's beside the point. Don't you get it? Nick would still be alive if I hadn't loved you. But it's very much the point, she insisted, her green eyes intense. You did love me, and I loved you, Nicky knew that. And it was his love for both of us that made him sacrifice his life. He scoffed. He shouldn't have. I didn't deserve that kind of sacrifice. He thought you were worth it, Victor. Believe me, if he didn't approve of you, he would have taken you down himself. There was no humor in her voice because they both knew she spoke the truth. Nick had been as fiercely protective as a brother as he'd been as a friend, even more. Still, Victor didn't feel worthy. He's probably looking down on me now, telling the Lord his regrets. He asked me one thing before he died, to take care of you, and I failed him. I broke my promise. It wasn't your fault, she insisted. You had no idea what was going to happen, I should have been there. I should have gone after you instead of staying downstairs like a coward, trying to sort out my feelings. I almost lost you. He sprang to his feet. The emotions he'd contained during the hostage ordeal finally rose to the surface, making it hard to sit still. He paced the room, coming to a stop at one of the large windows. He raised a hand to the cool glass and rested his forehead on his fist. Through the uncovered part of the windowpane, he stared out at the sparkling ocean below, watching the sun dip into the horizon. Glimpsing a view of God's creation like this would normally bring him peace, but tonight it only served to remind him of what he had lost. The beautiful colors of the sunset faded and disappeared into the dark waters, like the dreams he'd held of a future with Natasha. How had he ever thought he'd be worthy of her love? A soft, warm hand suddenly grabbed his, pulling him away from the window. Natasha gazed up at him, her eyes filled with tears. Hey, you never answered my question. What question? The roses, were they for me? What does it matter? He tried to pull his hand from hers, but she held on tight. I don't deserve to be with you. Answer the question, Victor. Were the roses for me? He sighed and nodded. Yes. Yes, they, before he could finish, her mouth was on his. It took a moment for his brain to register the act, 
but his body responded instantly. The softness of Natasha's lips, her sweet scent, and the feel of her hands on his face all drove him to action. He pulled her close, close enough to feel her heart beating against his, then kissed her back, fully, eagerly, passionately. He didn't understand how she could still love him, but he felt it in her touch. Natasha knew the kind of man he was, yet she kissed him with such abandon as if she didn't care. Or maybe it was because she cared so much that she could look past his weaknesses and faults. Her love for him made him want to be the man she saw. To be the man she deserved. He needed to tell her. He pulled back, cradling her face gently as he gazed into her eyes. I don't deserve your love, Tasha, but I don't want to live without it. I need you. You make me want to do better, to start living again. You even make me want to smile more, he added with a teary grin. I was going to tell you all this when I gave you the roses. They were supposed to be a peace offering. I hope it's not too late. She shook her head adamantly. It's never too late to kiss and make up. Well, we already did the first part, so, wait right here. Victor let her go for a brief moment as he rushed to grab the roses from the hall. He returned, offering her the box with outstretched hands. Tasha, these are for you. Thank you. She beamed. They're beautiful. Victor stepped closer, needing to explain himself. I know you thought I didn't want to kiss you in the car earlier. But the reason I stopped wasn't because I didn't want it. I wanted it too much. He rubbed the back of his neck, his face heating. I know we're legally husband and wife, but the reason we got married wasn't exactly conventional. I wanted to be sure we were on the same page about our relationship before things progressed. Her brows shot up in amusement. Things progressed. What exactly do you mean by that? I might need you to elaborate. The flirty look in her eyes just about did him in. He held on to the last bit of self-restraint he had as he took the roses from her and set them to the side. Smiling, he wrapped Natasha in his arms. Before I to elaborate though, I have a question to ask you. She gave him a curious smile. Ask away. Even if it was a little late for formalities, he wanted to do right by her. Holding on to her hand, he dropped to one knee on the marble floor. With a heart full of joy, the very joy she had brought to his life, he gave her the brightest smile. Natasha Joy Livingston, there's no one else I want to laugh with, shop with, and do life with. I love you. You're God's perfect partner for me. Will you do me the honor of staying married to me? She fell to her knees in front of him, tears streaming down her cheeks. Yes. I will, I do, all of the above. For real this time, Victor. I love being your wife. I love you. With that heartfelt declaration, she leaned in and settled into his embrace as if she'd never left. Epilogue Natasha Natasha gasped in delight as she stepped into the multi-purpose room at Hearts and Hands the following Friday afternoon. The rec center looked completely different decorated with silver and white streamers, silver balloons, and roses in every shade of pink imaginable. Instead of rugs, the children sat on matching folding chairs, looking cute and dapper in their best outfits. A piano recording of the Wedding March Toon began playing, announcing her entrance. Everyone in the audience rose to their feet. Holding on to Uncle Silas's arm, Natasha walked forward, her heart softening at the sight of the tall, handsome man at the end of the aisle. 
This was it, the day of her and Victor's union. Although they were technically married, they had decided to have an official ceremony, one in the presence of their family and friends. She couldn't think of anywhere else she'd rather get married at than the rec center. Mrs. D. had happily honored their last-minute request, believing she had played a role in their relationship when she'd whispered in Victor's ear to hold on to Natasha. And what better day to have the wedding and the day of the piano recital. Her students had done a wonderful job performing their pieces earlier. Now they stood patiently and quietly, staring in awe as she walked by. Natasha spotted more familiar faces, Nikki and Victor's old colleagues from the precinct. Seeing them, dressed in their dark blue uniforms, made her vision blur. Oh, how she wished her brother was there, too. At least she had something to remember him by. Her hand went to touch her something borrowed item, Nikki's silver cross hanging from the chain around her neck. She also wore reminders of their parents, her mother's lace-covered wedding gown with one of her father's handkerchiefs sewn into the fabric of the skirt. By the time Natasha reached the end of the aisle, her eyes were brimming with tears. Uncle Silas handed her over to Victor, who took both of her hands in his. The sight of Victor in a simple black tuxedo with a matching bow tie and suspenders made her stomach drop. He had never looked so handsome. His dark hair was combed back off his face, giving her a clear view of the laugh lines around his eyes. She couldn't get enough of his smile or the tender way he held her hands, as if he never wanted to let go. Victor brought one of her hands to his lips and placed a soft kiss on her palm. He mouthed the words, I love you, telling her what she already knew. She had learned so much about love recently and had seen it in action. She had no doubt Victor would risk his life for her. But even more, she knew her heart was safe with him. Her lonely days were behind her with this wonderful man by her side. Both Natasha and Victor faced forward as the pastor began his message. He spoke words of affirmation and encouragement, reminding them of the attributes of love from 1 Corinthians chapter 13. At the mention of the line, love never fails, Natasha was more sure than ever of her commitment to Victor. She was ready to say yes to a lifetime of love, trust, and commitment, this time with no strings attached or contract necessary, other than the vows they would make before God and man. She couldn't wait to say her vows. When the pastor instructed her to do so, she stated with confidence, I, Natasha Joy Livingston, take you, Victor Studley Price, to be my wedded husband, to have and to hold, from this day forward, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish, till death do us part. A few giggles sounded from the kids in the audience at the mention of Victor's middle name. When it came time for Victor to say his vows, he gave her hands a gentle squeeze and said, I, Victor Studley Price, take you, Natasha Joy Livingston, to be my wedded wife, to have and to hold, from this day forward, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish, till death do us part. This time, everyone in the audience, both young and old, chuckled. Victor kept a straight face, but the tips of his ears pinkened, revealing his discomfort. Now, now, there's no need to be embarrassed about your middle name, sweetheart, Mrs. D, called out from the first row, especially when it's true. This comment made the room laugh even louder. By now, Victor's whole face flushed beet red. He looked like he wanted to run and hide behind the piano, but he cracked a smile and called back, I'll take that as a compliment. Then he winked and wiggled his eyebrows at Natasha. She burst out laughing to see this new playful side of him. 
the simple act endeared him to her even more. It was this moment that the two of them came back to later that evening when they were alone together. This time when they arrived at the condo, Victor carried her, wedding gown and all, over the threshold. Natasha squealed in delight as he spun her around the living room before setting her down gingerly. She kicked off her heels and plopped onto the floor, cushioned by the full skirt of her gown. Thank you, Victor. He sat down beside her, leaning his back against the sofa. With an open smile, he asked her, for what? For being such a good sport during the vows. She gave him a cheeky grin. The kids really loved your middle name. He chuckled as he shrugged out of his tuxedo jacket and took off his bow tie. It wasn't so bad. I kind of felt like a rock star afterwards and the boys came up to ask me how to spell it. That was cute. Who knows, it could be really popular a decade from now if they all end up naming their son Studley. He paused and smiled. Which means, if we want to use it first, we might want to get a head start. Natasha's eyes widened in surprise. What are you saying? I'm saying that maybe we could revisit the conversation we started the other day. The one about. He reached for her hand and pulled her close so they were face to face. His voice grew husky as he answered, about things progressing between us. Oh, that one. I remember now. She smiled knowingly, placing a hand on his broad chest. The adoration in his eyes made her insides melt. She had a good idea where this was headed, and she liked it. How about elaborating on it now? His dark brown eyes twinkled as they zeroed in on her mouth. With pleasure. Victor then gently and slowly lowered her onto the luxuriously soft wool rug beneath them. Taking his time, he trailed one finger down the side of her face and brushed it across her soft, pink lips. With an easy smile, he leaned in to kiss her. One tender kiss to remember the past. A passionate one to celebrate their future. And countless spine-tingling ones that let Natasha know just how much he cherished her. Thank you so much for listening to Lawfully Cherished. To learn more about Li Wen Wai Ho's other books, please check out her website at liwenho.com. Please be sure to subscribe to this channel so you'll be notified when a new audiobook is released.